Hey guys how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. Today we will see what if Tsunade treat Naruto like a son. If you enjoy then please like share and do comments. Tsunade ended up spending the entire duration of her pregnancy in the small cottage her grandfather had built with his Mokutan Jutsu for when he needed to get away from the bustle of a growing Konoha. Shizune stayed with her, and Minato made it a point to visit at least once a day to bring them supplies and check up on the baby. His trips became more frequent when Tsunade took to throwing one of his Hiraishin Kanai, left with them for emergencies. Every time she had a craving or just wanted to chew him out really good. The ingenious little seals inscribed on the three-pronged weapons let him know every time one was thrown, and he always showed up just in case this time it was important. Tsunade seemed to be entirely ignoring the fact that it took two to tango and was taking all of her frustrations and fear for the future out on Minato, but he couldn't work up the nerve to point that out to her. Her mood swings made rabid hungry weasels seem predictable and rational and his manhood was already threatened more times than he was comfortable with as it was. Despite his predecessor's obvious hopes for them, Yandaimi was pretty sure he and Tsunade would never get past a platonic sort of relationship. He frowned and idly tapped a pen against his desk as his shadow clones industriously read and signed off on paperwork throughout the room. There was the age gap to consider, but that was surmountable. It was Konoha, itself that he was sure would always be their hurdle even if they could find some sort of common ground for affection, and he couldn't see any way around it. Regardless, his life was kind of on hold until they could figure out how to deal with all of this. He was really looking forward to being a father, but the situation constantly weighed on his mind. He was a man of action, charging in and getting things done. He'd never been forced to really put something this important on the back burner before, but he dreaded the confrontation that would resolve it, especially since he had no idea where he should really stand and what he should fight for out of the many issues surrounding this situation. He was a completely confused mess, and he knew it. If that wasn't enough, before all of this had happened, He'd been all set to finally go out with Whirlpool's Uzumaki Kashina, but he didn't really feel comfortable doing that when he couldn't be completely honest with her. Impending fatherhood is not really something you should start out a relationship hiding from your girlfriend, so he'd put her off with excuses about being busy with Hokage duties. Understandably she was getting impatient and not a little bit pissed since he'd been chasing her pretty hard until he'd found out about the baby. She'd probably decided he was a complete ass and moved on. He sighed, he couldn't really blame her, if she had, especially since he wasn't willing to risk a relationship with his child over anything, let alone a romance that wasn't even guaranteed to work. He had no delusions that Tsunade wouldn't bring it up romantic entanglements when they finally couldn't put this particular fight off any longer. She was a brilliant woman and he really felt like he needed to have all his ducks in a row if he wanted to get along congenially with the mother of his son or daughter and have any hope of convincing her he deserved access to the child just as much as she did. If he had to give up Kashina to be a parent, then so be it. It wouldn't really be fair to her to drag her into this mess anyway. That being said, he'd be damned if he let Tsunade run off with his son or daughter, but he was sure she'd never agree to stay. Despite the lack of death and destruction during her most recent stay in the village, she was still adamant that she would never raise a child that close to Konoha and he was sure she'd never be happy staying in Shodai's retreat. The hidden village of the leaf would forever be associated with taking from her everything she ever cared for, and she'd never feel comfortable with her kids so close to what she perceived as a cursed death trap. Especially if the kid was to frequently visit his father there. She was already going stir-crazy in that small cabin. Minato sighed. He'd be lucky if she even managed to make it through the next few weeks until the birth. If Tsunade were to frequently take the baby out of the village, as much as it hurt him to even think of it, he had to consider that it might be best for the kid if his or her paternity wasn't even known to the general public. He had no illusions as to how safe a child of his would be without him there to protect it. He'd never forgive himself if some stone ninja went after his child in some twisted plot to get revenge on the Yellow Flash for his part in the Third Great Ninja War. Tsunade's reputation might serve to keep them off but it might also make them even more determined not to let a child with that kind of pedigree reach an age where he could be dangerous. He wished he could talk to Kakashi about it. His student had grown up under the shadow of the White Fang and on more than one occasion had to deal with grief-crazed shinobi bent on revenge for things his father had done. He wanted to know how he dealt with it and how often it happened, how easily the plots were thwarted, that sort of thing. 
He couldn't confide in the boy though. He couldn't tell anyone until he and Tsunade could talk it out, and at this rate, the kid would be Godem by the time they both could even decide what it was they wanted. Yandaimi's pen snapped at that thought and ink went spattering over everything. He cursed loudly then waved away the Anbu that came to investigate the commotion. Morosely he cleaned up the mess as best he could before turning back to the window and sinking back into his thoughts. He'd probably be getting along better with Tsunade if she hadn't taken to abusing the Hiraishin Kanai. He'd fallen off the ceiling once, been neck deep in one of Jiraiya's swamps twice. Despite his occasional lack of self-preservation instincts, the sage knew when to just shut up and do it without asking questions. He'd been summoned under giant slugs, in piles of garbage, and on one memorable occasion, halfway in the oven. Which was on. For the most part, he was a good sport about it. She was carrying his baby, and he'd known better than to let her manipulate him into drinking that night, but it was getting really old and he'd had to come up with a lot of excuses for why he kept needing to procure new Hokage robes. Additionally, it was hard to have a rational conversation with someone when you were dealing with second-degree burns over the lower half of your body, even if they were letting their apprentice heal you right away. If that wasn't enough, he'd also been dealing with his Hokage duties, and someone had been setting the tailed beasts loose on various villages over the past few years. He'd had a side project going for a while now on something to counter it if it ever happened to Konoha, but he hadn't had a chance to work on it in months. It would probably work, but it would definitely kill whoever tried to use it, and it still required a sacrifice to seal the demon in which was absolutely unacceptable in Yandaimi's mind. He was unceremoniously jerked out of his thoughts when the tower began to shake a little and off in the distance, in the exact direction of the Shodem's retreat, the sky burned red. Oh please no, fucking Kayubi had the nerve to go rampaging through her grandfather's cottage a small house that had stood testament to her ancestor's amazing skill with Mokutan Jutsu since the founding of Konoha. She'd had a lot of fond childhood memories of that place. What's more, the damn Nine Tails had the utter gall to do it when she was just over eight months pregnant and miles away from any defenses aside from Shizun whose poisons wouldn't do squat against a several stories tall monster made entirely of the chakra embodiment of pure malice. Tsunade growled through the shooting pains in her back. She really did have the worst luck ever and this sealed it. Konoha was definitely out to get her. We've got to keep going Tsunade-sama. Shizun urged her, doing her best to support her staggering mentor as they fled the destruction Kayubi was causing behind them. They'd gotten away from the house and started heading for the dubious safety of the village's walls in what had seemed like plenty of time. The giant oppressive cloud of hatred that preceded the demon along with his huge ass body made it kind of hard to miss when he headed towards you. Unfortunately, the stress of his presence and the panicked flight from their refuge towards the last place in the world she'd ever feel safe had kicked the slug sonin into premature labor. This, understandably, slowed them down quite a bit. Fucking Minato, bastard couldn't make his jutsu work two ways could he? How much harder could that have been, huh? She gasped. They'd been outside when they'd felt the first waves of the Biju's killing intent and had been more focused on escaping than going back to the house for the Hiraishin Kanai. So even if the Yandaimi had the foresight to make them work so they could summon other people to him, it wouldn't have done them much good. That bit was lost on Tsunade though, as she had very little room for rationalizing through a haze of pain and fear. Especially when her legs gave out from under her during a particularly strong contraction only moments after her last one had stopped. Damn it, we're not going to make it to the village, let alone the hospital. She gasped, you're going to have to deliver this brat here. It's got to be a son. No girl would be this rude and pushy. He's going to take after that bastard of a father, I can tell. Try to stay calm, Tsunade-sama. If the baby's ready to come now, then there's nothing for it. Remember to breath, Shizun said. She'd been afraid something like this would happen. Hash of course I'm going to remember to breath. Tsunade gritted out through clenched teeth. Why do people always tell women in labor to do that? If I ever say that to someone, I want you to kick me. Her apprentice ignored her with practiced ease, as she did her best to clear a spot on the forest floor, and laid out her outer robe to try and make her mentor more comfortable. Together they managed to get Tsunade arranged as best as possible, but the situation was definitely less than ideal. The baby was early enough that he'd be small, so despite the fact that this was her first child, the birth was likely to be fast. They were fortunate that Tsunade was as far along as she was. 
The baby had a good chance of being healthy even if he was a bit early. There were medical jutsu which would have it set to rights in no time as long as he or she was developed to a certain point. The baby was crowning by the time Minato managed to find them. He ditched his Anbu guard, sending them to the front, while he went to find out what had happened to his unborn child. He assuaged the waves of guilt he'd been feeling for letting his personal concerns trump his duty to the village, by telling himself that his baby might be the solution to all of their problems. The idea of what he would do if they could manage to force the child to be born before it was too late made him slightly ill, and the horror of what would happen to his precious village and everyone inside it if they couldn't ward for supremacy in his mind. He refused to think about how he'd convince Tsunade it was necessary if they had to induce labor, just as he refused to believe the high probability that he might not find her alive. When he arrived in their little clearing to be met by the cries of his firstborn son and lack of resistance from his already very protective mother, well, that was it then. It had to be fate. There were no other women in the village due to naturally give birth soon enough, and all the current infants were older than a few hours into the world and so were unlikely to survive the process. His face was a mixture of sadness and the reflexive joy of all new fathers when he accepted the bundle of squirming infant from Shizun while the girl continued to work on her now unconscious master. It was easy to slip away and join Jiraiya and Gamabunta at the front lines. In the end, he supposed it didn't matter that they'd not made any concrete plans for their son's future before he actually arrived. There'd be very few choices now. He'd have to be satisfied with getting to hold a name and see the tiny wonderful face of his legacy before he gave his life for a village he knew very well might grow to hate their tiny savior, but what choice did he have? Forgive me, Naruto, he murmured, as he lay dying after performing the massive ceiling, he carefully kissed the top of his sleeping son's head and passed the baby to his sensei. He thought there might have been tears in Jiraiya's eyes but his own vision was getting too hazy and he was too far gone for his usual panic response. You're a godfather, sensei. He gasped. Make sure they know your godson's a hero. And with those final words, the Yandaimi died. By the time Tsunade got her first look at her baby, he'd already been given the unfortunate name of a hero from Jiraiya's new book. Lost his overly noble father who didn't even have the decency to build up a respectable alcohol tolerance, and been saddled with the most perverted, free-loading, horrible godfather in the history of perverted, free-loading, horrible godfathers. She hoped this wasn't a sign that her son had inherited her luck. Shocked from seeing blood of which she was phobic and giving birth less than a mile from where the most powerful of the tailed beasts had been tearing through the village's defenses hadn't been very good for her health, and she'd passed out rather quickly near the end of the ordeal. On the upside, she thought she'd somewhat come to grips with the blood thing, as this experience with it had brought her the most perfect, precious, bundle of blonde joy she'd ever seen. She'd managed to sleep through the trip back to Konoha, which had probably been pretty uncomfortable both for herself and Shizun, who'd had to carry her, and she'd also managed to miss the anxiety of knowing what that crazy bastard was doing with her poor Naru-chan before she knew he'd come safely out of it. There was no way in hell she'd have agreed to it if she'd known, but she was happy to be spared the worry during the whole ordeal. This and the lingering discomfort of having just given birth no matter how good your healer happens to be probably saved quite a few lives in the aftermath of Tsunade learning just what she'd missed while she was out. An enraged Tsunade was something the shinobi of Konoha had learned to deal with, but an enraged Tsunade protecting her son was on an entirely different level, and something they wouldn't witness for many years to come. As it was, she was grumpy, but holding her small, but perfectly healthy but for the demon sealed in his belly son kept her from completely flying off the handle. In fact a strange sense of contentment and peace had settled on her despite what Minato's actions might mean for their kid's future. The baby in her arms opened and closed his tiny fists and moved his head a little. It was the most adorable thing she'd ever seen. Tsunade quietly cooed at her son from their place on a rather uncomfortable cot in a little forgotten room in Hokage Tower. After the stunt his dad had pulled, there was no way she'd let herself be seen with an infant anywhere near Konoha for a rather long time. People might put two and two together and get Kayubi Vessel, and she wasn't having any of that, so her only option was hiding out for the duration of their stay here. Come to think of it, she was really glad they hadn't told anyone about the baby for a variety of reasons. A. No one was supposed to know Kayubi had been sealed into a kid, and therefore everyone knew and wanted to kill it, and B. 
letting the world know the greatest medic nin in history and granddaughter of the Shodem had procreated, however accidentally, with Konoha's infamous yellow flash, directly relating the boy to all but one of the leaves, known for its strong ninja, strongest ninja and one of its sanin was probably ranked pretty high up there on the bad idea scale. Really strong ninja tended to collect really strong enemies like old men collected stamps. Tsunade inwardly cursed Minato, despite the fact that it wasn't good to think or speak ill of the dead. He might as well have painted a giant bull's eye on poor Naruchan along with the fancy ass seal. Hopefully, if she played her cards right and managed to get out of Konoha without anyone the wiser, everyone would just think she had became another one of the many Kunoichi who decided to have a kid of her own without unnecessarily tying herself down to someone else. That kind of thing wasn't exactly an oddity in a world full of highly independent women who were trained to have illicit affairs for information and infiltration purposes or hold on to clan positions which needed heirs without the complications of marriage and possible loss of political power to a spouse not of their blood. It wasn't uncommon at all for high-ranking and politically powerful women to have children and give them the maternal family name, so if they played their card right Senju Naruto shouldn't raise too many eyebrows. For the second point, Ideally most people would just assume that the Kayubi kid was just some random brat pulled off the street rather than the son of two of their most prestigious heroes. When he failed to make his presence known, they'd no doubt think that he disappeared, probably killed by someone who didn't want to take credit for it and get himself executed for breaking the soon-to-be-announced fourth law of secrecy. No one knew his name or what the infant had looked like, bundled up as he'd been on the battlefield. So as long as they didn't have to see him and be reminded of the terrifying force of nature held at bay in such a tiny, fragile body, human nature dictated that they'd probably be quick to forget about him. Out of sight, out of mind. Celebrate Naruto-kun's birthday on his original due date, and presto, no one the wiser. After all, everyone knew Tsunade had a huge aversion to returning to her home village so it would seem unlikely that she and her newborn son would have been there during the attack. If her kid happened to look a great deal like Konoha's favorite martyred Hokage, well, his mother was blonde too, and she'd been through lots of places with predominantly blue-eyed people in her travels. Maybe his father was from Lightning Country. The coloring wasn't that uncommon over there. Her fierce grin slipped a bit as she took in all the ways her baby obviously took after his father. Though still a bit red, it was evident that his complexion would be darker than hers, and that bright shade of yellow hair was all Minato. She'd be willing to bet his eyes were going to brighten up rather than darken when they settled into his adult color. If you ignored the whisker-like birthmarks on his cheeks, he'd probably end up being a tiny Yandaimi clone. She sighed, well, at least those aren't likely to give him away either. Lots of ninja families have weird markings. Just look at an Inazuka. Looking at Naruto, it was hard to believe the Yandaimi was gone and her sweet little baby was the jailer for a massive, malevolent demon. The cheeky blonde punk had been a constant annoyance and source of anxiety for her for the last several months, but she had faith in Minato's ability with seals, and even more faith in his love for his son. After all, she'd had to deal with his constant cooing at her stomach, babbling of possible baby names, including the one he'd stuck the kid with. Damn that Jiraiya, it was somehow his fault, she was sure, and for the sake of little Naruto, now sleeping so peacefully in her arms. He'd even put up with her messing with him by summoning him in as many different, uncomfortable, and embarrassing situations as she could think of with that trick Kanai of his. She'd never given him a chance, she realized, too worried about him demanding to keep their baby and with his village behind him, having the power to take yet another bit of her family away from her. It was extremely ironic that now, he was the one who'd never get to see his little boy grow up. Looking out the window at the city Minato had sacrificed himself to save, the same city all her loved ones gave their lives for, as it struggled to deal with its devastating losses and revive itself from the wreckage, she couldn't help but feel a little uneasy about her decision to totally alienate herself and her son from Konoha. She'd never seen before what was so great about it that they all had felt it was worth their lives to govern and protect. But both she and Minato had been born here, grown up here, been ninja here, and though many of her loved ones had died here too, this village had given her Naruto and in a way, her loses had been a part of that. If she hadn't been feeling so sorry for herself that night, she'd never have fallen into bed with Jiraiya's prize pupil. Maybe someday, if he wanted it really badly, she'd let Naruto come back long enough to become a ninja of the leaf. 
Knowing her luck, odds were the kid would be genetically predisposed for obsession with Hokage Hood anyway. What was the point of fighting against inevitability? But definitely not until he could properly defend himself, at least Chunin level, maybe Junin, or Anbu. No, he definitely had to be Sanin level first. She nodded to herself, yeah, that was reasonable. No one could fault her for that logic. What do you think Naru Chan? She whispered to her sleeping son. Should we go wake up Shizun and get out of this hellhole? Naruto slept soundly in reply, after all, he was a newborn. They really only had three modes at that stage of development. She took this for tacit agreement. Tsunade levered herself up off of the cot, careful not to jostle the tiny bundle in her arms, and padded silently towards the door. Jiraiya, when he'd had a chance to stick his head in earlier, had informed her that her apprentice had fallen asleep almost as soon as she drugged them into the tower. She'd been exhausted from stress, the birth, and healing Tsunade in its aftermath, not to mention the amount of effort it had taken to be stealthy while trying to get them to hiding without being seen by anyone in the general confusion. She'd been given the room next to Tsunade so she wasn't too hard to find. Once informed of the situation, Shizun was extremely apologetic about the whole, handed your baby to a man who sealed a demon in him, thing but in her frantic efforts to save her master she hadn't really thought twice about giving the baby to his father to hold. Who could blame her? Well, Tsunade kid, and it would have been ages before Shizun lived it down enough to be trusted to babysit her precious Naruchan if infants had been allowed in bars and or casinos. As it was, in the years to come she got plenty of one-on-one -on -one time with her beloved adopted nephew. No, no, Naruchan, don't chew on that, that's Ka-san's lottery ticket. Tsunade scolded her precocious toddler. The kid had a knack for physical things and getting into trouble. He'd rolled over early, crawled early, and started walking almost immediately after. From the way he was eyeing the tops of the shelves in the convenience store they'd stopped in to buy supplies, she knew it wouldn't be long before he was scaring the shit out of her by seeing how many things he could fall off of without breaking his head. He undoubtedly took after his father. There wasn't a self-preservation bone in his little body. Shizun liberated the now soggy bit of paper from her nephew's mouth and frowned to see he'd managed to scratch off a bit of it. The poor guy was teething like mad and nothing was safe from his tiny fangs. He had, oddly enough, gotten his canines in before his front teeth. Tsunade juggled her purchases while trying to put her wallet away and stared fondly at her apprentice and son. Shizun was taking a closer look at the ragged ticket while trying to keep Naruto from grabbing it back in chubby fists. Suddenly her eyes grew large and she exclaimed, Susunade sama. You won. What? She nearly dropped the bags of groceries she just paid for. Let me see. Technically, the kid just won. The amused store clerk pointed out, he's the one that scratched it off. You've got quite a lucky little guy there. Yes, you do. Who's a lucky little guy? Babies turned most people into even larger idiots than they normally were. It was Tsunade's rule of the universe number 46. She was working on a theory that the maternal or paternal instincts in adult humans overrode at least 20 of their normal brain function when in the presence of miniature versions of themselves. The vocabulary centers were the first to go. No one was immune. Orange. Naruto cheered, that being his favorite all-purpose word. He used it for everything for which he had no existing vocabulary and sometimes for things he just thought were more, orange, than whatever the rest of the world felt they should be named. He'd even called Jiraiya, orange, until his mother had taught him the word, pervert. Finally able to set the bags down without upsetting anything, the legendary sucker snatched the winning ticket from Shizun's hand and stared at it. I'll be damned. Well, it was only fair, she supposed, in the cosmic scheme of things, if the kid got his dad's recklessness, it should be balanced out with proportionally good luck. Somehow, this didn't make her feel better. Probably because Naruto had begun eagerly pointing to the tops of shelves again, and yelling, orange, excitedly. Tsunade handed the ticket back to the clerk to cash it out and wasn't surprised when the woman didn't even flinch at its kind of disgusting state. She would have had to stop cooing ridiculously at a dumbfounded Naruto in order to notice. She and Shizun always made it a point to talk to the kid as if he were a real person whenever they could free themselves from the baby effect. This caused Naru Chan to be supremely confused when other adults babbled in length at him in high-pitched, nonsense phrases for great lengths of time as the store clerk was doing. 
He got the most adorable look on his face and those huge blue eyes blinked several times as if he were trying to puzzle out what kind of strange disease she had and if it were contagious. What that? He asked, pointing at the starry-eyed woman as his mother pocketed his winnings and picked up the bags of groceries again. That's a babbling moron, Naru Chan. Can you say, moron? Sensei, stop teaching my nephew to insult people. Orange, they left the store to the indignant sputtering of the offended woman behind the counter. Back at the small house they were renting by the month, Tsunade took Naruto from her apprentice while Shizune went to put the supplies away. With a somewhat steady income generated by the lack of a blood phobia preventing Tsunade and Shizune from privately hiring out their healing services or working at local hospitals or clinics whenever they needed Ryo, they'd taken to staying in places for much longer than they'd been used to because all the parenting books said kids needed stability. She was pretty sure the authors of the books had never seen a baby thrive on absolutely everything like Naruto did. He wasn't scared of a damn thing and absolutely loathed routine. Every time he had a new experience, or they went somewhere he'd never been before, he damn near wet himself in excitement. He was the single most vibrant and simply alive thing she'd ever run across. There was no way something as terrible as the Nine Tails could be influencing the brat. He wouldn't know hatred if it walked up to him and started making faces and babbling like that store clerk. She hadn't seen a single sign of the Kayubi influencing her son's actions, and she'd been looking. She wanted to be ready if they had to track down Jiraiya and get him to look at the seal. So far, the early teething and whiskered birthmarks were the only things that even showed her son wasn't a normal, unpossessed, baby. The seal was always visible which worried her a little since Jiraiya had seemed to think it should only show up when his chakra was active, but his energy flow was really steady for a toddler's something that ran in her family, and she hadn't ever sensed the demon at all. Of course, that also contradicted Jiraiya's theories about the seal. He'd seemed pretty sure the fox would manage to throw Naru's control all to hell by constantly throwing bits of his chakra into the normal coils. A downside to the seal's natural, built an ability to slowly merge the power of the biju with the boy over time. If that were the case, Tsunade's medic senses should have been able to feel it, at least every now and then, but she hadn't noticed even the normal, spurts and starts most children, at least those not directly descended from the shodem, seemed prone to. Unfortunately, she wasn't a Hyuga, so she couldn't be sure what exactly was going on, but a few of her jutsu could give her a pretty good picture and it seemed to her that the toddler's body was dealing with his prisoner much better than expected. Nevertheless, she'd put the word out that she wanted to see her old teammate about something important, and she expected him to show up looking for free food and board any time now. Naruto yawned as they padded through the house and she decided to put him down for a nap. He usually balked at naps like you had suggested he bathe in filth instead of rest for an hour or two, but he was still only a baby and he got sleepy in the afternoons. They'd found if they didn't mention the word, nap, and just sort of wandered around the house holding him until he dozed off, it saved everyone a lot of accusatory exclamations of, orange, and heart-wrenching pouty faces. It was something about the two large blue eyes and sun-colored hair. No one was cold-hearted enough to resist that face. It had been really useful in getting away from debtors, actually. You don't need the money right now, do you? Look at that face. You can't take money away from me that I could be spending on him. The baby effect definitely came in handy, despite its inherent annoyances. Naru Chan's eyes had closed now and he'd begun to chew on her shirt absently in between soft snores. Tsunade grinned, he was just too damn cute, even when he was drooling all over her favorite green gambling coat. She gently laid him down and smoothed a few locks of blonde hair out of his eyes, frowning a bit at the odd emerging birthmark on his right cheek. If it continued to darken, it might obscure the whisker marks somewhat on that side, but it was kind of strange. She wondered if Minato had been related to some Inazuka after all. The quiet mother and son moment was broken by the sound of the outside door slamming open in a cheerful greeting of, Hey, Shizun chan What's for lunch? Ringing through the hall. Naruto's eyes immediately popped open and he snapped up like a jack-in-the-box hands making grabby motions to his mother to be picked up and carried to see the visitor, Aero Gigi, he begged, practically vibrating in happiness and Tsunade sighed. It was nice that the two got along so well, Jiraiya was his godfather, after all, but she swore on the blood of her ancestors, if that bastard influenced her son into being a pervert, 
she makes sure he'd never be able to enjoy those tasteless books he wrote ever again. Where's my little godson? said Pervert Boomed, strolling into the room like he owned the place. Tsunade couldn't begrudge him when she saw Naruto's eyes light up even more, if that were at all possible. Jiraiya's brows furrowed in thought as he studied the seal on the toddler's stomach. The little tyke had been all too happy to ditch his shirt. You couldn't keep clothing on the kid to save your life unless you reminded him that big, strong ninja always wore their shirts for their mommies and didn't argue about eating their peas. For a moment, he was baffled. The seal seemed to be working absolutely perfectly and just how it had been designed to function. The only explanation he had for its constant visible state was that the kid were constantly molding chakra for some reason, which even his age aside, was pretty much impossible. He'd heard that some of the rarer blood limits dealing with elemental manipulation could cause a constant, small drain on the bearers, but Yandaimi and Tsunade weren't carriers of any special traits that he was aware of aside from the usual flavors that ran through certain ninja family lines, advanced chakra control in Tsunade's case, and speed in Minato's. The kid was too young for the speed, even if it had developed into something on the level of a bloodline in his father. While his chakra flow was a little steadier than most kids his age, that could be explained by practice and the small natural aptitude males of the Shodem's line inherited. He was always using it for whatever the hell it was doing so it made sense that he'd be pretty good at it. Jiraiya doubted this was a sign of his mother's godlike control. Besides, control didn't explain what the chakra was doing or why Kayubi's essence was entirely undetectable in the kid. The fox was in there, he knew that, he'd seen it sealed with his own eyes, and the kid had the whiskers to prove it. Idly, he tried to brush what looked like a large smudge of dirt off of Naruto's cheek while he thought. Hmm, the damn spot was kind of stubborn. He rubbed harder and Naruto began to wiggle in protest. What the hell have you been playing in Naruchan? The older man frowned, squinting at the stubborn stain. It almost looked like it was underneath the skin, and the shape was kind of weird. Tsunade was shocked speechless when she came in a few minutes later. Jiraiya, are you drawing on my baby's face with a marker? That had better be non-toxic, and washable. Her fist clenched and began to rise slightly. Wait, wait, I can explain. He hastily backpedaled, babbling in his haste to avoid dismemberment and change the subject. In truth, he didn't know if the marker was washable but he wrote himself notes on his hand with it all the time, so he was sure it was safe. Sometimes he didn't have paper on hand when great inspiration for a novel happened to strike. I think I figured it out, and you're not going to believe it. You figured out what's wrong with Naruto's seal by drawing a weird floral design on his face? He could tell she didn't believe him because her face wasn't looking any less thunderous, and the heavy threat of violence still hung in the air around her. I didn't draw it, I traced it, and it's not really that floral. I think they're more like vines and leaves. It's not clear enough to tell, yet. He hurried to explain. It didn't take her long to connect the darkening spot on Naruchan's cheek with Jiraiya's stint at face painting. She leaned down and squinted at the design, though it was hard to get her son to cooperate and turn his head properly so she could see it in the light. He seemed to have given up on understanding adults some time ago, and decided they must be playing a new game that involved grabbing each other's faces. Shit, Tsunade finally agreed, what the hell? You'd have to do a blood limit test to be sure, but from what I can tell, there's no other explanation. Jiraiya grinned, Shodem's Mokutan and Biju controlling abilities have turned into a properly inheritable Keke Jenke. The sort of one that acts at least somewhat subconsciously, and is always at work keeping the Kayubi in line. Tsunade frowned and licked her finger to rub at the marker on her little boy's face in the kind of utterly gross gesture only mothers can get away with. That would explain why grandfather's techniques weren't copyable and hadn't presented themselves until now. It's not uncommon for something like this to go dormant for a generation or two while it transforms from a specific individual's genetic predilection into a family trait. Many of the clans started that way. Yeah, well, I don't care about the specifics. This is great. Jiraiya exclaimed, he's got a natural talent for dealing with the fox. It might not ever bother him at all. He might not even know he's got it. The natural drain might even act like chakra pool training. The kid's capacity will be huge before he ever even learns to use it. Tsunade didn't seem to be sharing his enthusiasm. Well, I guess, but it would probably make his Mokutan jutsu harder to use, 
the Keke Jenke would almost have to multitask to keep the fox's raw chakra from leaking out with the assimilated chakra. On top of that, what if he ever does use Kayubi's power? His natural system is built almost as its antithesis. There's no telling what kind of effects that would have. Jiraiya frowned, good point. Well, I can't say one way or the other. All I can tell you is that the seal is working exactly as it was designed to do, and that birthmark on his face looks an awful lot like plant life to me. I'd put money on it being the physical manifestation of a blood limit, and something's keeping Kayubi's chakra from only getting into the kid's system after it's been completely changed over into his own chakra type. Signs point to Mokutan. Naruto seemed to have sensed the seriousness of the situation and instead of squirming around and trying to grab their faces, he'd taken to chewing on a lock of Jiraiya's long white hair. His huge eyes stared up at them solemnly. I'll use the Keke Jenke testing jutsu, Tsunade stated, but I'm inclined to agree with you. I guess we'll just have to see what kind of effects this has on him in the long run. Want orange? Naruto complained as Jiraiya tried to deprive him of his current chew boy. Confusingly, but not surprisingly, Orange was also the name of the boy's favorite stuffed toy, a red frog with stylized black lines running over its plush body. He always wanted it when the adults around him had him upset, though he wasn't nearly as attached to it as Jiraiya had heard some kids got to things like that. He bought it for the brat's birthday because it reminded him of Minato's favorite small summon, and he wanted the kid to have as many small bits of his father as he could manage to give him. The sage was surprised to see it was still in pretty good shape when they finally managed to find it under the bed's dust ruffle. He loves this damn thing. Tsunade muttered, attempting to knock some dust bunnies off of it before giving it over into Naruto's grabby hands. You and Orange go help Shizune in the kitchen. She commanded the little boy, lifting him up and tapping his butt in a playful swat to get him moving. The kid giggled like a lunatic as he took off on short, chubby legs dragging Orange by large plush flipper, and yelling for his, Zoon. Were you ever that cute as a kid? He knew he shouldn't have said it as soon as the words left his mouth, but he'd never been very good at not saying the wrong things around her. Later that night, with Naruto safely tucked into bed with his ironically fluffy frog toy, the adults sat around the kitchen table with sake, in Jiraiya and Tsunade's case, and tea, for Shizun. Well, the jutsu confirmed it. Tsunade said, taking a small sip from the saucer in front of her. She'd cut back a lot since she'd had her son, but she still really liked to indulge. Gambling just wasn't the same without sake, after all. So Shodem Sama's ability to perform Mokutan Jutsu has become a Keke Jenke in Naru Chan? Shizun fiddled with her cup, I never would have expected. Well, we don't know exactly how it's going to manifest now that it's a blood limit rather than just a natural proclivity. It could be more or less powerful and controllable. It might even have entirely different effects. Odds are it's still plant-based, and it definitely affects demon chakra. That's about all we know for sure. Tsunade clarified. Jiraiya nodded in agreement. You can never tell with a new bloodline limit. That's why a lot of ninja families never try to develop their natural skills into more advanced genetic ones through breeding and stuff. Like established clans with known bloodlines do. I see. Shizun looked thoughtful. This isn't going to be unhealthy for Naruchan, is it? I know it hasn't hurt him so far, but if I understand what you told us about Yandaimi Sama's seal, it's built to let him use the Nine Tails power to some extent. What if it reacts violently to his system? Tsunade nodded, she'd pick well in Shizun. The girl had real talent and the smarts to back it up, we already talked about that. There's really nothing we can do about it until we have more information. It may never come up. It could be that Naruto's body will simply not allow that part of the seal to activate. What if he's really hurt, or runs out of chakra? Well, then, that could be bad. If it comes to that, there's always a five-point seal. It should block off Kayubi's chakra completely, but it could also throw his system out of whack so I don't want to try that unless it's necessary. He's managing the fox much better than I ever dreamed possible as he is, and I'm a big fan of, don't fix what isn't broken. Tsunade had to agree. She just hoped it didn't come back to bite them all in the asses later. She'd never forgive herself if Naruto died and they could have done something to prevent it. Naru-chan, it's time to put on your shoes and get ready to go to the clinic with your Ka-san and me. Shizun said. Her cute adopted nephew, brother figure had recently had his second birthday and was already well into his, terrible twos, stage. 
Tsunade claimed if she heard the word, no, one more time, she was going to go completely insane and start setting fire to things. Shizune decided it was probably best if she took over the majority of the Naruto-related duties until he grew out of it a bit. Speaking of her mentor's currently least favorite word, no, Naru-chan said, his face set in an adorably obstinate little pout. He had a hold of Tonton's vest and seemed to be trying to hide behind the small pink pig. You know we do this every day Naru-chan. Ka-san and I have to go to work so we can buy you things and pay for the house. Now, let's get your shoes on you. She leaned down and reached over Tonton, but Naruto sidled around the pig. Shizune frowned and turned to catch him, causing Tonton to turn, causing Naruto to giggle and dance sideways as well. This went on for several minutes until she finally lunged over the poor traumatized pet to snatch the toddler up. He squirmed and protested, but she finally got him sat down on the couch and started to put his shoes on him. She was stopped from putting his left shoe on after his right one had been fastened, by his shirt hitting her in the face. Naru Chan, no, we don't take our clothes off except for baths and sleeping, remember? If you do that, you'll have to wear the onesies again. No, he looked horrified. Bad, Zoon. She scrunched the shirt back up and pulled it back over his head, helping him get his tiny arms through the holes. Don't call me, Bad, Naru Chan. You know you're not supposed to do that. Be a good boy and wear your clothes and let me put your shoes on you, and you can have a treat later. Orange? Yes, you can take orange with you, too. K. Okay. He stuck his thumb in his mouth and looked up at her with his angelic little face. Seeing him like that, it was hard to believe he'd been terrorizing the house all morning. She stood up and turned for a second to get his jacket when she felt something hit her in the back of the head. Ouch! She spun around to find no toddler on the couch and a tiny pair of shoes laying discarded on the floor, one of which had just be used as an impromptu projectile. The imp had good aim for a baby. She had to give him that. She sighed and followed the trail of discarded clothes to find her charge attempting to scale a tree naked but for his diaper in the backyard. This was going to be a long day. Tsunade cursed as they tried to make their way through the busy streets of Grass Country's capital city. This move had seemed like such a good idea at the time. Grass Country was plagued by easy to deal with things like allergies. It was mostly flat, relatively dry plains, so there wasn't a lot of rain or standing water, so sicknesses didn't really stick around or get carried by bugs too often. Add to that the fact that the boring terrain made injuries minimal, and it was a lazy medic's dream. She figured that the most a medic would have to deal with was the occasional mauling by a predator hiding in the thick vegetation to ambush random passers-by. Best of all, without any significant geographical features to bring in tourists, the whole country was dotted by world-famous casinos and other attractions in order to compensate. What she'd failed to take into her calculations when deciding on their current relocation, was the fact that everyone else thought it was a good idea to move here too, or at least visit really often. The place was packed, idiot cart drivers were everywhere, cursing at each other and proving a danger to themselves and pedestrians. She saw more cart accident victims than she dealt with sunstroked people in the month they'd lived on the border of sand before Naru'd been born. It was rule of the universe number 34 that people automatically lost 10 IQ points the second they got behind the reins of a cart, and some people just didn't have 10 IQ points to lose in the first place. After five minutes of waiting for a gap in traffic so they could cross over to the space they'd rented to set up a small clinic, Tsunade had finally had enough. Naru-chan, what mommy is about to do it very bad. When you're old enough to demolish things, don't try it, okay. The little boy nodded solemnly. Shizune quickly opened her mouth to protest, but it was too late, she'd already put a fissure in the road upsetting two carts and causing a complete stand still in the traffic. There were loud curses and screams of outrage everywhere. Bad Ka San. Yes, Naru Chan. Very bad Ka San. Shizun thought about covering his ears so he wouldn't hear the expletives being hurled between his mother and the irate drivers around them, but figured it was probably way too late to keep him innocent of curse words. He did live with Tsunade, after all. What a cute little boy. Tamazawa San exclaimed, spying Naruto playing with his stuffed frog on a blanket in the corner on the clinic. Tamazawa-san was a hypochondriac, Tsunade could tell. He'd come in complaining of malaria and he hadn't been to AIM in his life. Naruto-chan recently turned two. She informed the older gentleman who knelt down beside the toddler and was reaching out to ruffle his hair. 
Ouch! The man exclaimed, hurriedly pulling his hand back. Be careful, she sighed, he bites. Great, now he'd probably be convinced he had tetanus or something. Shizun dug out a piece of poster board and a marker and plopped it down beside the blanket. It read, beware of baby. Good idea. Tsunade grinned. That's why you pay me the big bucks. Shizun deadpanned. What had started out as a perfectly average day took a surprising turn after that. Shizun and Tsunade looked up at the sound of the bell over their door tinkling a welcome to see an Anbu with long red hair tied back in a low ponytail and an otter mask stumble into the clinic, practically dragging her blood-covered partner. Tsunade's eyes widened. The man looked pretty bad, and even with the mask, the girl looked familiar. The only way that was possible was if they were residents of her old home village. Crap. Tsunade-sama, please help us, the girl gasped. Put him down in there. The medic barked, pointing to the examination room behind her. You're Konoha ninja, aren't you? Are you hurt anywhere? Where is the rest of your team? The woman laid her partner down as carefully as she could on the table. We're from Leaf, yeah. That's why I brought him here the mission we were on went totally to crap. We were cut off from the rest of our team and trying to hide on the western edge of the city. Lucky for us, I heard people talking about you being in town after the huge cart wreck this morning. It's taken me this long to get us here. I'm not hurt, but we can't risk being seen. This is Black Ops, and Lion Coon is practically hamburger. I couldn't move him very quickly without messing him up even more. Alright, get out of the way and let me take a look at him. Shizun, bring Naru chan in here so we can keep an eye on him. I'm going to need your help with this one. She cast a glance at the tired and dirty looking Enbu woman. Sit down before you fall down. Even if you're not hurt, you're obviously exhausted. The woman nodded, I'll be out in the other room, if you want. I can keep an eye on the kid for you, while you work. She sighed, hearing Naruto's protests. He obviously didn't want to pause in his plane to relocate in there. Well, you can try, but in your state, I doubt you're up to it. We'll just leave the door open in case you need help. Otter San blinked. How hard could it be to watch a baby? He'd seemed to be playing pretty quietly when they came in. She went to relieve Tsunade's apprentice of Naruto sitting duties, and got a sinking feeling when she saw the, beware of baby, sign. Naruto looked up at her when she slid down the wall to sit beside him on the floor. He seemed to be attempting to completely cover a large red plush toy with as many plastic bandages as he could tear out of their packaging. He was doing a damn good job of it too. Well, Naruto-kun, are you playing med nin and patching up your frog? Otter asked. She figured she might as well start up a conversation with the kid, as much as you could with a toddler. Maybe it would keep her awake. She hadn't slept in over 48 hours. They'd been on the run and she'd been worried her partner would die if she stopped giving him first aid. No, the little blonde boy said. He orange. Oh, okay? Well, he was a toddler who knew what went through kids' minds at that age. He looks kind of red to me orange red he agreed covering up one huge bulging eye of the toy with a large gauze pad um well not really he's a pretty bright red why am i arguing with a two-year-old about what color his plushie is orange no orange he looked distinctly suspicious now and not a little upset um whatever you say kid k he went back to clumsily wrapping the frog in medical tape otter sighed and slid off her mask it was technically a breach of protocol but who was this little guy going to tell? Besides, the string was frayed and about to break so she'd have to find something else to fasten it with soon, and it was hot under there. She pushed her long red bangs off her face. She needed to get them trimmed. Even her whirlpool forehead protector wasn't holding them back much anymore and her hair clip was proving useless. She leaned back and closed her eyes for a moment, only to startle them open again when she felt a weight on her lap. The kid had climbed up on her crossed legs and was reaching towards her face menacingly with a band-aid. Er, thanks, but I don't need one. She gently caught his hand a for a moment their eyes met. The kid had really rare colored eyes. She'd only even see that shade on one other person. Come to think of it, they had the same shade of hair too. She frowned and he mimicked her expression. Just to see if he'd keep it up, she threw him a cheeky grin, and her breath caught when he returned it. He looked just like well, minus 25 years or so, but still. I must be more tired than I thought, kid. She groaned and lifted him off her lap, for a minute I thought you looked just like this jerk I used to be in love with, ouch. 
She glared at the baby beside her who was now frogless. What the hell? Aren't babies supposed to be cute? Who do you think you are, throwing shit at me? Lady Bad. It was probably good things hadn't worked out between her and Minato. If they had, she might have found herself stuck with a little monster like this someday. It was a few more hours until Tsunade strolled out of the medical room and scooped up her little demon spawn. Your teammate is going to live, but it's a good thing you got him to us when you did. He wouldn't have made it all the way back to Leaf without medical help, and I'm guessing whatever mission you are on is off the books. The redhead nodded, we aren't sanctioned to seek outside aid, but you're still technically a Konoha shinobi, so. Tsunade nodded, sensei wouldn't mind you getting our help, even the council wouldn't be able to complain. I won't ask what you were doing way out here, I know you can't tell me. You'll have to stay with us overnight, though, because Lion San isn't going anywhere until at least tomorrow night. Shizune and I are good, but we aren't that good. Otter sighed, but she'd expected something like that. Thanks for putting me up, Doc. No problem. Tsunade frowned down at the woman who had forgotten to put her mask back on. You're Uzumaki Kashina, aren't you? She swatted at Naruto's hand when he attempted to grab one of her ponytails to chew on. The Anbu looked stunned for a moment, before realizing her face wasn't covered. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'm Kashina. I saw you around a lot when I was growing up. You hung out with Minato's sensei, Jiraiya, a lot. Tsunade dodged a wildly flailing orange with expert ease. She felt kind of bad for the girl in front of her, almost like she'd stolen the life she was meant to have. She jiggled the sun that could have been the redheads on her hip, then chewed on her lip for a minute. Well, come on. Shizune's got a spare set of clothes in the back. You can shower and change back there, and then Naruchan and I will take you too. Get something to eat. You look like you could use a good meal. And it's the least I can do. She mentally added. Really? Great. Can we get ramen? Tsunade blinked. She must really like ramen to want something like that after what she'd obviously just been through. Hey, sure. It's not exactly the best thing for a kid as young as Naruchan, but it won't hurt him to eat it once or twice. The woman levered herself up gracelessly and threw the mother and son a grin, awesome. Thanks, Doc. She scampered out of the room in the direction Tsunade had indicated. It's a good thing that weirdo tomboy isn't your mommy, isn't it Naru-chan? You'd probably grow up to be a mannerless, ramen-eating freak. K. Naruto cheered. What? No, I didn't mean you should try to do that. Ka-san, bad, arg. It didn't take long for Kashina to wash up and change and before Naruto and Tsunade could really get into it, they were on their way to the nearest ramen stand. The Sanin found herself unsurprised that even half dead with exhaustion and worry over her partner, the Kunoichi had made a mental note of the stand's location when they'd passed it on their way to get medical help. Tsunade grimaced as they slid under the curtains and grabbed stools at the counter. Naruto wouldn't have stood a chance with this girl as his mother. He'd have had ramen eating genes coming at him from both directions. He'd probably have eaten instant ramen for breakfast if they'd been his parents, and knowing Minato, he'd probably have let it happen. Kashina noticed the look on her escort's face as she motioned for the cook to get her two bowls of miso noodles. Don't you like ramen, doc? Huh? It's not my favorite food, but I like it well enough. Why do you ask? Oh, it's just that you made a face when we sat down. The Anbu watched the toddler in Tsunade's arms delicately sniff the air like a cat, his eyes getting bigger and shinier with each breath. Ah, oh, the Sanin settled the kid a little more comfortably on her lap and pointed to the pork ramen on the menu when the chef looked in her direction. It's not that, it's just that ramen reminds me of Naruto's father, he used to eat it a lot. Geez, Kashina, way to stick your foot in your mouth. She berated herself, everyone was always telling her she needed more tact. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring up a subject that's painful for you or something. Her comment was waved off, it's not that big of a deal. We weren't all that close, though he definitely had his good points, and at times I admired him quite a bit. In the end, he was a complete moron. Er, I'm sorry? She had no idea how to respond to that. Yeah, me too. Kashina thought the look Tsunade was giving her was a little strange, but before she could comment on it, her food arrived, alright. Itadakimasu. Want. Naruto exclaimed, madly trying to wiggle onto the counter and claw his way towards the Kunoichi's ramen. Tsunade groaned. This was definitely a bad idea. She had a feeling she'd be paying for this one for years to come. Kashina grinned and playfully flicked her chopsticks at the kid, spattering him with broth. 
Maybe the little brat wasn't so bad after all. Nothing else very eventful happened during the rest of her stay with the Senju. Once Tsunade had shown her back to their little rental, she'd fallen asleep on the couch pretty much as soon as she'd seen it, and slept until her partner woke her up the next day. They were both eager to get back to Konoha and find out what happened to their other two teammates. Take care of yourselves, and don't push it on the way back. Tsunade lectured her patient. If you reopen those wounds and otters got to drag your ass back here, I'll let Naru-chan be the one to stitch you back up. She warned the poor man. Kashina winced, that was harsh. She adjusted the cloak on her shoulders and knelt down in front of the toddler standing beside his mother's apprentice and playfully tweaked his nose. You take care, Naru-chan. Eat lots of ramen and grow big and strong so you can come back to Konoha one day and join my division. You'll be a terror on the battlefield, I can tell. K. Naruto grinned and pulled a bandage off of orange and stuck it over one of the eye holes on her mask before she could even register what he was doing. She chuckled. The kid had a nice set of reflexes for his age. She straightened up and peeled the plastic off her mask while Shizune scooped Naruto up off of the ground. Wave bye bye to Otter San and Lion San. One chubby fist opened and closed rapidly in their general direction and both hardened Anbu internally. Ah, Ed. He was just too cute. They returned the wave, and Kashina couldn't help but smile under her mask. She was definitely interested in seeing how that little guy turned out. She really hoped he ended up back in Konoha. It wasn't until Naruto was three and a half that they managed to find out for sure in what ways Kayubi could still affect its host through the bloodline limit. As predicted, once he'd really gotten a handle on the whole, being ambulatory, thing, it had become impossible for someone who wasn't a highly trained ninja to keep up with him and prevent him from falling from one perspective death trap or another. Luckily, his guardians all were highly trained ninja, but even they had to sleep sometimes and no one can keep up that kind of vigilance 24-7. The kid seemed hell-bent on sending himself to an early grave, or at the very least, scaring his mother and Shizun there. You couldn't keep him out of trees or off of roofs to save your life and they'd all quickly learn to immediately look up whenever he'd managed to pull a disappearing act. Unfortunately, looking up wasn't always a good idea, even if he was up there, because he also showed an early penchant for practical jokes and pranks, so you were likely to get a face full of muddy water. It was one such time, when he'd given all three of his frequent guardians the slip, that he discovered the horror that were bees. Huge fuzzy monstrous bees of stinging death. For the first time in his short life, Naruto learned the true meaning of fear. The first few stings hurt a bit and confused him. He hadn't done anything to the noisy bugs to cause them to bite him. Sure, he'd thought about trying to pet one since it was so oddly fluffy for a bug, but he hadn't had a chance to yet. He just wanted to get a closer look at their weird house. Before he knew what was happening the strange structure had emptied itself of its inhabitants, and with a loud scream of terror the little boy jerked backwards to escape his small black and yellow assailants. This of course caused him to go tumbling from the tree, and he'd really been quite high up. His cheek tingled oddly and he hit several branches he didn't remember being there on his way down, but they didn't do much to slow his fall. The forest floor rose up to meet him alarmingly quickly, the vast horde of devil bugs following him the entire way down. He lost consciousness as soon as he hit the ground. Tsunade and Jiraiya were immediately alerted to the fact that Naruto had managed to slip out of their care by his terrified yell. The slug Sanin had never felt something quite so horrible as the terrifying jolt that particular sound sent through her as her instincts as a mother and a medic immediately clamored together that something was very wrong. Neither adult even stopped to look at each other before taking off in the direction of the noise. It took them only seconds to reach the little boy, in fact, she almost managed to catch him before he hit the ground as his fall seemed to have been slowed a little by some suspiciously conveniently swaying branches. A quick Sweden jutsu from Jiraiya managed to soak mother and son, but dissuade Naruto's crazed pursuers from further tormenting the boy. Tsunade quickly forced the mother and her down in favor of the medic. She knew Naruto wasn't allergic to bees, she'd done allergen tests on him as a matter of course, but multiple bee stings could be extremely dangerous, especially on smaller or weaker people like the elderly or children, and Naruchan was already beginning to swell up with what seemed to her panicked mind as hundreds of angry red bumps. He'd also landed pretty awkwardly on his arm, and though it hadn't broken completely, she'd be willing to bet it was at least fractured. How is he? 
She could hear Jiraiya's voice, but she tuned him out, concentrating solely on completing a jutsu to pull out the chemicals from the bee's stingers. She had to be fast or his already closing airways would seal and he'd suffocate. Before she could apply her glowing hands to Naruto's body, his breathing suddenly became easier and tiny wisps of red chakra began to trail up from the deflating swellings covering his body. The wounds looked like they were burning away, and Naruto's arm no longer felt broken to her medic senses, though more of the red chakra was coming from that area than the rest of him. What the? She murmured. Kayubi. Jiraiya answered, crouching down to get a better look and be nearer if he needed to intervene. Before the process could quite finish, the red chakra abruptly cut off, and Naruto began to tremble and retch. He immediately developed a fever, and soon coughs racked his tiny body, flecking his lips with blood. To Tsunade's horrified medic's senses, it looked like Naruto's chakra system was attacking everywhere the Kayubi's lingering essence had pooled, re-damaging tissues in its seal to push out the malicious energy. It didn't take long for the large pockets of red chakra to be broken up, but the little bits splintered off when they shattered like shards of glass from a broken window, and they drifted through his system, chased by enthusiastic blue bits of his body's natural energy. This process was much slower and looked like it might take a while to complete, but Naruto's reaction had become less violent and while he was still running a fever, the violent retching and coughing had stopped. What the fuck was that? Jiraiya exclaimed, Shizune and I were right. Kayubi's regenerative powers seemed to have been passed on to Naruto, and they kicked in when he was weakened enough for his defenses to fall. Once it had taken care of most of the damage though, he had a secondary reaction to the Biju's powers caused by his Keke Jenke attacking the fox's power in his system. His body seems to be treating it like an infection. She frowned and carefully cradled the boy against her chest, feeling some of her residual panic subsiding at the heat of his body through their soaked clothing and the familiar weight of him in her arms. She continued stroking his sweetened and sweat-soaked bangs away from his forehead. I imagine he'll be pretty sick for a few days at the rate things are currently going. She sighed and deactivated the monitoring jutsu she'd reflexively started as soon as she'd reached him. As long as there are no other complications with it, I think he'll make a full recovery, but we'll have to be careful and watch out for this in the future. Something similar will probably happen every time his body is weakened enough to have to draw on his chakra system, and next time it might be even worse than this. Jiraiya frowned and gnawed on his lower lip for a few minutes. Do you think we should go ahead and completely seal off the Kayubi? The kid probably won't need the chakra boost from the assimilation. Not with you and Minato for parents. Tsunade stared down at the face of her baby, but then raised her eyes to meet her teammate's gaze. No, no, I think we should leave it. It's kind of like my Sozo Saisei, Genesis Rebirth, technique. It's dangerous, but it should only kick in when he really needs it. It's never done anything about scraped knees or anything minor. Unless we discover any really bad side effects, I think it may be worth it to leave things as they are. She looked back down at Naruto as she started to shake a bit in delayed reaction to how close she'd just come to losing the most precious thing in her universe, the only thing that had given her back her reason to really live and not just exist. We came so close to losing him forever, Jiraiya. I know. He's so damn hard to keep track of. The other Sani murmured. I don't know how he can be so damn loud one minute, then just poof, disappear, the next. Maybe I can invent some sort of tracking and communication seal. Work it into jewelry or something. Tsunade nodded and gave him a tentative smile, one far gentler than he'd seen from her in years. Since they'd been kids, in fact. Something like that would definitely be useful. Let's get him home now and dried off. He needs to be in bed. He's not nearly as bad off as he originally was but he's still a very sick little boy, and I don't think there's anything Shizun and I can do to make this better. It's going to have to run its course. The toad sage nodded, sure. Do you need help getting up? She looked a little shaky with reactionary nerves. She started to automatically disagree, but then looked up at him with that weird smile again, and lifted the hand she wasn't using to cradle Naruto against her. He took it and pulled her up with ease. Together they started back to Tsunade and Shizun's most recent little rental. Jiraiya took off his coat and wrapped it around mother and son. Thanks, no problem. He easily replied, then frowned a bit and peered closer at Naruto's face. Your son's girly clan marking is nearly black now. What the? Tsunade tilted his face a bit to get a good look, huh? Well, I thought I saw the tree, 
Hey. There's nothing girly about my son. Jiraiya grinned and took off running. The only safe time to tease Tsunade of the monstrous strength was when she had her hands full with Naruto and couldn't hit you or chase you down. It didn't take them long to get Naruto back to the house, into clean, dry clothes, and bundled into bed. He was still running a high fever and hadn't yet woken up. Tsunade briefly activated her diagnostic jutsu again to see what was going on, and after determining that nothing was getting worse, she got up to get a bowl of cool water and a cloth from the bathroom. Jiraiya sat himself on the edge of the bed and smoothed the kid's hair away from his forehead, a frown creasing his face and pulling at the red lines that ran down either cheek. He's still really hot, I know, Tsunade answered, shoving the bowl at her former teammate. Make yourself useful. He easily caught the cloth she threw at him after taking the water, and began gently bathing the child's face and neck with it. Tsunade walked over to the trunk she stored her medical books in, and began looking to see if she could find any reference to treating chakra-induced infections. The room was silent for quite a while aside from the sounds of water dripping into the bowl and pages turning. Jiraiya caught himself running the damp cloth over the much darker mark on Naruto's cheek for the millionth time. You know, if the mark darkening means his bloodline has fully awakened, we're going to have to start training him. Tsunade slammed her book shut and tossed it back into the trunk, then flopped down in the chair she used when reading to Naruto at night. Absolutely not, he's not even four yet. He's just started to learn to read. Most kids don't start to train at three, true, but most of them don't learn to read then either. It's not unprecedented. Hitaki Kakashi started way early, and I hear the Uchiha's heir was trained from a really young age and has advanced really quickly. You're not helping your case any, Jiraiya. I don't want my kid to be some super ninja freak with no social skills. He's a kid, he's going to do kid things. I don't know if he'll really have a choice, Tsunade. He rewet the cloth and folded it up, before placing it on the sleeping boy's forehead. If his keke jenke is active, then his chakra system must be advanced enough for it to function on some level. He's going to need to be trained or there's no telling what could happen. He hesitated to go further, but he felt it needed to be said, besides, it's not. Exactly easy for him to connect with his peers if you keep dragging him from place to place. As he gets older, he's going to have even less in common with normal village kids than he does now. It might help him to have a constant focus in his life. Tsunade got up and sat down on the bed opposite him, where she could see Naruto's face flushed with fever. If they didn't get a feel for his limits and how chakra use was going to affect his situation with the fox, things like this might happen more often and in less predictable situations. She bit her lip. Okay. We'll train him, but he's going to be a med nin when he grows up. Are you kidding me? Have you met your kid? He's hell on legs. There's no way you'll ever get him to sit through boring med nin lectures. It takes way too much bookwork. Aside from that, you give him a complex trying to get out of your shadow. The kid's like his father. He's going to kick ass and take names. Besides, I can tell already that he doesn't have your natural control. It's not bad mind you, and likely to be better than most of us, men but I'd wager it'll be nothing to write home about. He doesn't have the concentration. He's not even four, of course he can't concentrate yet. She replied heatedly. Being a med nin is less dangerous than a stupid tank like Minato was. He'll need to avoid injury even more than most people if this is what happens to him when he gets seriously hurt. All the more reason to focus on teaching him to defend himself. We'll toughen him up properly before he ever sees combat. The hell you will. I'll give him my special dodge training, and that'll be plenty. Jiraiya looked aghast. You'd put your own son through the torture you call, dodge training. That's child abuse. I thought the idea was to prevent serious injury. It's not that bad. Shizun still flinches if you even mention the word, dodge. Er, well, I'll go easy on him until he can take it, but he's learning to be a med nin, and that's that. A cleared throat from the doorway made them both stop arguing and turn in that direction. A frowning and worried looking Shizun stood in the doorway, cradling a pig in a red vest and necklace. Um, not to step in here, but what happened to Naru Chan, and don't you think you ought to let him decide what he wants to be when he grows up? Tsunade looked indignant, are you kidding, he's a little boy. All he's likely to want to do at the moment is learn how to smash things, blow things up, and look cool doing it. See, I win. Jiraiya cheered. No one smashes things like I do. Tsunade snarled raising her fist to demonstrate. 
You still haven't told me what happened to Naru Chan. Shizun interjected, don't fight over his poor sick body. Tsunade and Jiraiya immediately halted their escalating argument and sat down looking like chastised children. Sorry, they muttered in chorus. Good, now, start at the beginning and tell me what happened. She snapped, setting Tauntin on the floor and marching over to them. After they'd filled her in, all three sat silently, deep in thought. Well, I agree that it would probably be best to start his training. Shizun, ever the voice of reason, piped up, but until he's old enough to make an informed decision about his future based on facts, and his strengths and weaknesses rather than an arbitrary, coolness, factor. I say we teach him the basics and work on his physical skills. The stronger he is, the less likely he'll get hurt badly enough for his defenses to fall. Besides, giving him something constructive to do might make him easier to keep track of and less prone to getting himself into this kind of mess again. The other two reluctantly agreed. Naruto woke up before dawn and stared at his ceiling sleepily for a few minutes. Life was definitely getting more exciting for him now that he was grown up enough to learn how to be a ninja. He'd been back on his feet and good as new within a week of the bee incident, due mostly to the diligence of his two highly skilled medic nin relatives who hardly left his side the whole time. He was no worse off for his little adventure, except for a new unholy fear of bees and a greater respect for staying near Ka San, Aero Gigi, and Zun when they were supposed to be watching him, and he'd become a little more attentive when they told him not to do something. His blood limit had definitely woken up and become more active. Plants started acting very strangely around the boy. To say their yard had a dandelion problem would be a monstrous understatement, and while most little boys had puppies follow them home, last week Naruto had been trailed by a tenacious vine of poison ivy. He hadn't asked if he could keep it. He seemed to have absolutely no conscious control over his new abilities, and it was annoying as well as embarrassing. On top of that, whenever Aero Gigi showed up, he teased him mercilessly about the mark on his cheek. It wasn't girly. No matter what the man said, the mark looked like stylized vines and leaves. Not like flowers. His Ka-san dutifully assured him this was so, and his Ka-san was always right. Unless there was money on the line, then you always guessed whatever was the opposite of what she said. Naruto had been training for almost a year now, and they'd settled into a decent routine relatively unchanged by their frequent moves from village to village. His guardians were sticking to the let him make up his own mind about his future decision, at least on the surface. None of them were above attempting to pound their specialties into his head when the others weren't looking and or in creative or manipulative ways. They also weren't above trying to sway him to their way of thinking. Recently, Zun Nichan had launched a pro-medic nin campaign proclaiming that medics were the natural enemies of bees, but he'd seen Gigi's toads eat all sorts of bugs and never seen her eat even one so he was pretty sure she was lying. No matter what they tried, it was pretty obvious that being a medic nin required a lot of stupid bookwork, and Naruto was having none of that, so he was leaning pretty heavily towards Jiraiya's side of the argument. Besides, Gigi offered to teach him a fire jutsu if he agreed to be a fighter, and everyone knew that setting things on fire was way cooler than healing burns. Naruto climbed out of bed and started his morning routine. No one else was up yet, but that was nothing new. Everyone else seemed to need more sleep than he did. As soon as he got his shoes on, he stood on tiptoe to open the door, and then slid out silently for his morning run through the village. He loved this time of the day. No one was up and everything was creepy and empty. It was pretty cool. So far Naruto didn't feel like he'd made much progress in his training. His Ka-san was really careful to monitor his chakra use. If it got low enough, Kayubi's untransformed energy might leak through and make him sick and she told him that if that happened he might not be able to leave his bed for weeks and he'd lose all that training time on top of being bored out of his skull. He still shuddered to think of all the crap they'd made him do while recovering from his first bout of Kyubi sickness. He'd written all the characters he'd learned so far like three bejillion times, and they'd started him on math and history. He hated math and history. That was also when he'd been introduced to the chart. The chart was a diagram of the human body with labels in various colors, and Ka-san had told him in no uncertain terms that he'd better have all the things she'd highlighted in blue memorized by the time he was healed or she'd make him stay in bed even longer as punishment for slipping away from her and Aero Gigi. The chart had been used for creative punishments like that ever since. 
He finished his stretches and patted his tummy over the fox's seal indignantly before taking off in as brisk a jog as his little legs would allow. Stupid Kayubi made everything harder. He'd been really surprised to learn he had a living thing in his stomach and that his dad had put it there. It seemed really kind of gross to him, and he didn't quite understand how it worked. He'd had bad nightmares for months of the demon bursting out and eating off people's faces after they told him the truth. He had a pretty gory imagination for a kid his age. Ka San called him, creative. He waved cheerfully to an old lady who was putting out her cat as he ran past her house. He loved the feel of really pushing himself to the limits, and he was starting to get into his first wind. Training was a million times better than watching Zoon read poison books or practicing making his letters. Sure. He hardly had time for tricks and pranks anymore, but he'd only really turned to them when he was bored anyway, so he didn't need them like he used to. The old woman waved back. She opened a bakery every morning and often saw him pass by on his daily stint. The child seemed to have inexhaustible energy. She wondered what kind of mischief he'd get into without his physical outlets. He was a sweet thing, but she was glad he had something constructive to do with his time. Swing by on your way back. Deary, and I'll give you a sweet bun. She called. She'd always firmly believed in rewarding hard work. Yosh, thanks Ba Chan, he called over his shoulder. Well, he was sweet, but that lazy no good mother of his should really teach him some manners. Poor Shizun San, to have to put up with that late, about gambler for a mentor. She shut her door and went to start preparations for the day with a huff. Naruto continued on his circuit, now in even better spirits. The old bakery lady made awesome sweet buns. Not as good as ramen, but Ka-san wouldn't let him eat that more than once a day, anyway. If he somehow managed to wrangle ramen out of someone for a pre-breakfast snack, she'd definitely make him eat with Yuhei-san, the village babysitter, whose husband owned the clinic they were helping it, instead of grabbing the tasty noodle wife food with Aero Gigi later in the day, and then he'd have to put up with the other village kids. They were just plain strange. Training was way better than any dumb game the village children here played. The seemed to have a weird obsession currently with a game involving pointy metal bits and a rubber ball in a circle. They called it, jacks, he called it, stupid. The jacks weren't even sharp, you probably couldn't even kill someone in their sleep with one, and they certainly didn't explode. He reached the end of his route and turned around to head in the other direction, feeling the pleasant pulling and tingling in the muscles of his legs. As he ran he tried to make his mind stop wandering, so he could go over the list of plants in his head that, Zun had given him to memorize. As soon as he could identify each one and tell her what parts were good and what parts were bad, which ones made people better and which ones made people sick, she'd promised to buy him a set of these cool new training straps that had just come out on the market which acted like weights. If you put chakra in them, they got heavier, and they helped you with your control too, because you had to always concentrate a little to make them work. They only got so heavy and you couldn't wear more than one set at a time, so they'd only help so much, but Naruto still thought they sounded really cool, and they came in orange. That occupied him for the rest of his run, interrupted briefly for the enjoyment of delicious bakery goodness. Once he made it home he ran in to get a quick shower, then grabbed, real, breakfast with his, Zun. Growing up he'd had a bit of confusion over what he should call his, Zun. Ka San got really sad looking when she tried to explain how Shizun Nichan was related to them so he mostly called her whatever he felt like, but he'd first called her, Zun, since that had been his first attempt at her name and that's how he usually thought of her in his head. While he ate his cereal, Zun grilled him on her plant lessons. She wasn't supposed to teach him stuff when it wasn't actually her turn. It was some kind of agreement the adults had come up with to try and torment him into playing with the creepy other kids more but none of them stuck to it so he didn't mind, much. He just had to be careful not to tattle on them to each other. Mommy always woke up late in the mornings, so she never knew that he usually spent the time before and during breakfast on Zun's extra lessons. They just put the books away and Shizun was cleaning up the kitchen while Naruto finished his milk when Tsunade finally wandered and looking like she was still half asleep. Naruto hopped up and put his glass in the sink, accepting the mug of Ka-san's morning coffee from Zoon while he was there, and carefully carrying it over to the table. Jiraiya said coffee was like a henge jutsu that turned zombie, Ka-san into normal. Grumpy, Ka-san. Naruto didn't know about that, but it did make her raise her head off of the table and make grabby hands in the direction of the cup, 
and after she'd consumed half of it, you could usually tell what she was trying to say if she talked to you. They never worried about Ka San noticing them studying at the table, because Zun said she wouldn't know if Tantan Tap danced on her head until she'd had at least one cup of coffee. After all of them had managed at least a little breakfast, the amount Tsunade consumed depended on how late she'd been up the night before and if Shizun had let her go to the casino, it was time for chakra control lessons. He was only allowed to work on that for a couple of hours and he was only supposed to do it with his Ka San supervision. This didn't stop him from sneaking out at night to keep at them on his own. He had to be really careful to stop practicing when his coils started to burn even a little, he'd be caught for sure if the nine tails made him sick again. If that happened, he'd probably have to memorize even more of the chart before he was allowed back into his normal routine. Alright, Naruchan, to the wall. He'd originally been given a tree climbing exercise, but that had turned into wall climbing instead when the trees kept cheating. Hi, Ka Sensei. Tsunade rolled her eyes at the stupid nickname and blatant abuse of the language and watched him get to it. He was a determined little bastard, she definitely had to give him that. She let him work on it until 10 o'clock, and then called a halt so he'd have time to re-energize before his lesson with Jiraiya in the afternoon. The old pervert wasn't around very often or for very long stretches, but he always insisted on training time when he was in town. Naruto sighed and reluctantly stopped charging at the wall. He hated it when chakra lessons were over because then, he had to practice his normal people lessons. This was stuff, Zun insisted everyone, even future awesome ninja like him, had to know like letters, numbers, and history. He hated them now just as much as he'd hated them when they'd first been introduced to him so he usually turned them into stealth and evasion lessons instead. He was getting really good at evading, but his, Zun kept cheating and having Tauntin help her find him. Tauntin was a traitor and he wasn't ever again giving that pig scraps from his plate if she kept it up. She wasn't even going to get his peas. He somehow managed to slog his way through a chapter of his Konoha-centric history text. It was big, and he didn't always know all the words, but he got quizzed once a week, so he had to try and learn it. Luckily, they only made him do history once a week. It was almost as bad at Ka-san's medic lessons, which didn't even need a place in the rotation because he got in trouble enough that he ended up studying those really frequently as it was. He didn't know why they bothered to make him learn this crap, he always just forgot it later, but they were adults and you had to humor them sometimes. Ka-san liked to try and motivate him by telling him that she'd show him how her strength thing was done if he didn't complain about the schoolwork but she'd gone and ruined it by telling him he'd never be able to do it as well as she could because he hadn't gotten her natural chakra control. She seemed to think there was some magic in having to sit down to pee that gave you more natural aptitude for that kind of thing. He totally didn't get it. He'd show her though. As soon as he could weasel the basics out of her, he'd try it over and over and over again until he could do it just as well as she could through practice and hard work. He didn't need any pansy-ass shortcuts like she did. Bah. I'm so cool, I'll show her. He was allowed to put his books away before lunch, which was always a hurried affair. Hurry up and eat, Naru Chan. We've got to get over to the clinic by 1 o'clock, Shizun said. Tsunade rolled her eyes, give the kid time to digest. If there's an emergency they'll come get us. Naruto ducked under the table. It was time for a responsibility lecture with a side helping of, don't be a bad example for your son. Zun's eyes always sort of glowed demonically and she seemed to grow about 10 feet when she laid into Ka-san about those things, and he couldn't make himself watch. It was just too horrible. Naru-chan, Tsunade eventually stuck her head under the table and winked at him. She was really brave to be able to withstand Zun's lectures like that, crawl out from under there and go get orange. It's time to go over to Yuhei-san's until the pervert comes to pick you up. Jiraiya wasn't allowed over to the house until well after lunch so he could only mooch one free meal a day from them at the most. Naruto blanched. No, he hugged her legs. Don't make me to go. He made his eyes really big and felt a faint zinging sensation that he'd learned to ignore zing through his face and chest. They had this conversation every day that Jiraiya was in town, and he always won. He didn't know why this worked, but it definitely did. It was a good thing too because he was supposed to be babysat while playing with Yuhei San's twins at the park, and waiting for Gigi, but when they weren't playing, Jax, they liked to pretend they were ponies, and he had no idea what that was about and wanted no part of it. Besides, he wasn't a baby anymore, so he definitely didn't need, sat. 
He was sure his plushy frog, Orange, agreed. The little monsters tried to dress Orange up as a kunoichi sometimes, and he hated that. He told Naruto so. Tsunade predictably melted. It was completely useless to resist Naru chan when he used the look. If she didn't know better, she'd think it was some kind of secondary keke jenke or some element of his original one. But people weren't biju, so that was impossible. She sighed, All right, Naru chan, go get orange in your books and you can study at the clinic while you wait. I don't know why you don't like to play with the Yuhei girls. They're perfect little angels with decent manners, unlike some rude, grungy, brats I could name. Ha, huh, yes, he cheered, ignoring her jibe and ran off to get his stuff. Bookwork was bookwork, but he didn't mind more of it so much if it was a choice between that and death by dresses for him and Orange. Luckily for him, Jiraiya had caught on to their routine and he'd been chased out of the local bathhouses earlier than usual that day, so he was waiting for them when they finally arrived at the clinic. You ready for training, Gaki? Don't call me a Gaki. Aero Gigi, he scowled, marching over to the much taller man and glaring up at him, his ragged toy frog clutched tightly in his fist. Jiraiya chuckled, I'll stop calling you a brat when you stop announcing that I'm a pervert in public. Tsunade rolled her eyes and strolled past them. They had a variation of this argument every day. Shizune and I will be home around the usual time, unless something comes up, again. Jiraiya had to train Naruto at their house because if he were allowed to pick the spot, he'd inevitably find somewhere with naked women within spying distance. Alright, we'll see you then. Come on, brat. He grabbed the back of Naruto's favorite bright blue jacket with the orange froggy hood and began towing the kid back the way he'd come. We'll see you when you get there. Bye, Zun Nichan. Bye, Ka San. Try to do your share of the work today. A vein in Tsunade's temple throbbed painfully as he screamed that out at the top of his lungs for the whole street to hear, if his father weren't dead, I'd beat him senseless. There's no way he gets that mouth of his from me. Shizun sighed and preceded her mentor into the clinic. Sometimes she didn't know who the more childish one was. Gigi was only supposed to train him for a couple of hours, then turn him loose, but he never did. This was fine with Naruto, he'd probably just keep training anyway. What else was there to do? If he pulled more pranks, he'd just end up having to study more boring biology, and it just wasn't worth it when he wasn't bored. Orange watched him from the porch as he kicked the log. He loved the kicking the log game. Gigi had introduced it to him as a reward one day after he'd shown initiative by asking a billion questions after practice a week ago. He'd set it up near the target practice dummy especially just for Naruto. It was so great. Naruto wasn't sure what initiative was but it must have something to do with asking why a lot and bugging the old man to tell him what the whole point of standing on one foot on one of the thin clothesline posts was during the endurance portion of their session. He'd also been initiative during the taijutsu portion that day, he guessed, because he'd asked a lot of questions behind the stupid taijutsu form he was having trouble getting. He couldn't seem to set his feet, just so, all the time, and it felt awkward. Gigi had been pretty sidetracked and kept brushing him off while he worked in his notebook and giggled a lot, and hadn't seemed to want to answer, but since he'd given Naruto such a great reward, he guessed it was some kind of test. When Gigi wasn't wherever they were currently living, Ka-san took over the afternoon sessions and made Zun go to work and heal people by herself. She called it her prerogative, because Zun was her apprentice. It didn't sound like much fun. Naruto was pretty happy he was her son instead, but he definitely wanted to get him one of those prerogatives so he could make someone else do his maths. Ka-san always made him do the normal things like laps and sit-ups and pull-ups, but when Gigi would usually have him work on taijutsu afterwards, she liked to throw things at him. She called this dodging practice because she said a good medic nin should never be wounded so they could always heal their teammates. The kids in the last village had a variation of this training but both sides got to throw things and try to dodge, and they usually used balls instead of whatever random things they could quickly pile up and lob at you when you weren't ready for it, so it couldn't possibly be as much fun as Kasan's version. When the girls finally got home from work, Shizun always oversaw his senbon practice. He really liked throwing the needles at the target dummy. It had been especially made to look like a person's insides, and as he threw, Zun barked out different targets he was supposed to be trying to hit. It was kind of annoying because then he had to remember his anatomy lessons at the same time, 
and sometimes she'd forget what he'd been taught and hadn't, so she'd tell him to aim for the hippopotamus or something, and he had no idea where that was. Naruto was pretty thrilled with the overall arrangement. He got to spend one-on-one -on -one time with all of his family members, and even if it was really exhausting and painful sometimes, it was way better than running around on his own or playing with stupid dolls like some of his peers had to do because their parents wouldn't put up a log in their yards for them to kick. His greatest dream was to be a really cool ninja like the stories Aero Gigi told him about his dad, and if he had to learn a few wimpy medic jutsu to get him there, he was willing to make that sacrifice. He absolutely loved 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 training for the most part. It was super fun, and he was really getting stronger. Someday he'd be strong enough to make a name for himself and become a hero. He'd protect everyone, and make Ka-san, and Zun, and Gigi really proud of him. Gigi said that when he was old enough he'd take him back to Konoha to become his apprentice, and that they'd be really surprised to see him, but they couldn't tell his mom about the plan until he was older, or she might not agree to it. He didn't know how he felt about that, because there, everyone would know his as, the legendary Tsunade's son, and they wouldn't know about his dad or Kayubi. He thought it might be kind of hard to deal with not letting his secrets out, and it would really piss him off if everyone in the whole village expected him to be a super med nin or something. It really made him mad when people did that. He was Naruto and his Ka-san was his Ka-san. They'd see how awesome he was though, and it wouldn't be an issue. He was sure of it. He grinned, put the leaf back on his head, and set it to spinning. It still had a habit of falling off when he started to gloat mentally, but he was sure he was getting better at it. He threw another handful of Senbon at the target dummy and whooped when they all hit it. Now he just had to fine-tune his aim so they all hit the specific targets and not just the dummy itself. How's it going kiddo? Naruto glanced over his shoulder to where he'd heard his mom approaching. He didn't know why she wore such stupid shoes with high heels on them. She definitely wasn't as sneaky as Gigi when she was wearing them, and his shoes were those weird platform sandals with the name that reminded Naruto of cheese. Geta weren't very sneaky. Ready to quit for the night? It's good. He slipped his remaining senbon back into the neat ninja pouch shaped like a frog that Ka-san had gotten him for a New Year's present and ducked his head a little when she insisted on ruffling his wild blonde hair. Do I have to go inside now? I wanted to kick the log some more before bedtime. Aren't you getting sick of practicing, chibi, and what's your obsession with that stupid log? He looked up at his Ka-san while she spoke, why don't you ever want to go play with the other brats? She frowned a bit as she caught sight of his knuckles from the variation on kick the log arrow Gigi had shown him today after seeing the neighbor's niece sunbathing in the next yard over. He called it punch the log. Gigi sucked at naming things. She immediately took his hands in hers to heal them for him. No, I keep telling you, the other kids are weird. They all want to pretend they are mommies and daddies instead of ninja, and even when I can get them to play ninja, they don't want to run laps or throw senbon or even play the original version of kick the log. It's madness. Er, sweetie, kicking the log isn't really much of a game. What about hide and seek? You love hide and seek. He nodded enthusiastically, but then his expression fell a bit. They don't let me play that one anymore because they all suck at hiding and seeking. They can't even find me by my chakra, and you and Zun and Gigi can always find me by my chakra. Sides, they all use smelly soaps that make them really easy to track. Tsunade frowned, I'm sorry, kid. I wish I could get you some other ninja brats to run around with, but your dad had a lot of enemies, and I'm worried they might notice the resemblance in most hidden villages. Maybe we can try hidden mist or sand. They're on decent terms with Konoha right now. I know it's not very fair of us to keep moving only to these larger civilian villages. Naruto hated more than anything to see his Ka-san looking sad. It's okay, Ka-san. I really love training. I gotta keep at it or I won't get strong. Being strong isn't the most important thing in the world, Naru-chan. His mother knelt down in front of him so she could look at him on his level. Ka-san was really tall. You know we'll love you and be proud of you no matter what you do or how strong you get, right? Naruto nodded solemnly, I know, but I really want to be a really strong ninja like great granddad and Tu-san so I can protect you and Zun and Gigi someday. I'll even be able to tell people who Tusan was, because I won't need protecting anymore. I'll be really cool, and no one will give us shit. Not even debt collectors. She winced a bit at that. Wouldn't you rather be a medic nin, Naruchan? 
You can save people and take care of them, without worrying nearly as much about having to kill or getting hurt on missions. He closed his eyes as she threaded her fingers through his bangs and into the rest of his thick hair. It always felt awesome when she did that so he didn't mind even if it made him seem a bit like a baby to so visibly enjoy it. I know, but I still want to be a protecting type ninja. I'll still learn the medic jutsu if you want, even though I really suck at it, but more than anything I want to be able to take care of myself and protect people like Tu San did. Even dumb kids who only want to crawl around pretending they are puppies all day. Watch me, Ka San. I'll be a hero and everyone will know me for me instead of you and Gigi. I'll be so cool that they won't even care about Kyubi. Even if I have to train every day until I fall down, or learn to kill, or whatever. I promise, Ka San. Someday I'll be really great like Tu San and Uncle Dan, and we won't even have to move around all the time anymore unless we want to, because. No one will chase you out of racetracks even if you can't find me to pick horse names for you after you lose all of our money. He paused to take a breath. I'll make sure everyone knows they can still chase Gigi out of bathhouses though, cause he's a pervert. Tsunade felt a little ill as a sense of maternal pride warred with her instinctive terror of her son someday returning to Konoha and trying to become Hokage and summarily being stolen away from her like everyone else she'd ever loved who had the same dream. She had an instinctive hatred for the term, hero, and it made her a little sick to think of her son wanting so badly to become one. She knew most little boys wanted to be like their fathers, but most little boys didn't have a father stupid enough to throw themselves in front of giant demon kings. It'll be okay, Ka-san. I know you worry about it, but I'm going to be even better than Great Grandpa Senju and Tu-san so I won't die. It's a promise, and you said a man can't ever go back on his words. She sighed. This was all Jiraiya's fault, she could tell. He was always filling the kid's head with stories of Konoha and its great ninja, especially his father. Looking at her son's determined face and seeing how hard he'd been working, though, her fear subsided, just a little. I'll tell you what brat. You promise to become as strong as you can, and let me put my Sozo Saisei, Genesis Rebirth, seal on you. And don't argue about wearing the monitoring seal the old pervert is working on no matter what the charm ends up looking like. And when you're old enough that the other kids your age will be graduating from the academy, I'll let your godfather take you back to visit Konoha and get your forehead protector. She didn't trust the Kayubi to always take care of him, and sometimes it might be better to lose a few years off of his total lifespan than to be sick in the middle of a fight so she was putting the Sozo Saisei seal on him whether he liked it or not. She poked him in the head, right where her seal's diamond shape would go, and her frown finally turned into a bit of a grin. You've got to prove to me that you can handle it though. I'm not letting you out of my sight until I know you can take care of yourself. That means mastering my super strength as far as you can and being able to take a hit from it. You've also got to be fast enough to dodge everything Shizune and I can throw at you, so you've got to get a lot faster and a lot stronger. There, that was a good way to hedge her bets, there was no way he'd be able to achieve the chakra control necessary for the strength, at least during combat. With the Kayubi taking up an unmeasured portion of his chakra at all times, he'd never have the pinpoint precision it took, and his ability to concentrate quite frankly sucked. What she failed to take into account was how well he could commit something to reflexive memory if he tried it often enough so that he wouldn't have to concentrate on it, and he wasn't at all adverse to trying something as long and often as he had to in order to make it reflexive. If I had half your brat's energy, I really think I could take over the world. Jiraiya told Tsunade one day. They were currently staying in a sort of ninja retirement village on the edge of wind country. It was her compromise with Naruto. Old people liked to bet on things because there wasn't much else to do, and they absolutely loved playing cards. Tsunade called it rule of the universe number 27. She was pretty sure you got handed a deck and some bingo cards along with your gold watch no matter from what job it was you were retiring. This sort of place worked out great for all of them. Naruto got to bug Ninja for training tips even if they were too old to really show him how they were done, Shizune and her could make a lot of cash because old people were always sick, and the gambling was as good as it ever got even if the stakes were a little lower than what she preferred. The fact that there was no one here worth peeping on, so Jiraiya tended to visit not nearly as often was just cake, really. It was extremely good cake. Hey. This was one of his rare trips, but she hadn't seen him for a little over three months prior, so she could deal. They were currently sitting out on their porch at a small outdoor table and chair set. 
The breeze was pleasant and played with her long blonde ponytails. What would you do with the world that wouldn't have the entire female populace rising up in arms and relieving you of your dick within the day? Well, okay. You have a point, but it was hypothetical anyway. He quipped, barely phased by the threat to his manhood anymore. He'd been known as the world's premier super pervert for four years now, ever since he finally put out his third little orange book. That reminds me, have you seen my newest title? After the flop of the first one, I almost gave up on the whole author thing, but wow, the Icha Icha series has really taken off. Tsunade raised an eyebrow and took another drink of her sake. There was nothing like good sake on a hot day. Jiraiya, if you still have your genitals, it's a pretty good bet I haven't picked up the latest piece of garbage you're trying to pass off as literature. Good point. He crossed his legs a bit self-consciously and grabbed for the bottle to refill his own drink. What the hell is Naruto doing anyway? I've never seen anything quite like that before. Oh, well, I was sick of him coming to me for new chakra control exercises every three seconds, so I told him to try combining the ones he already knew. So he decided to cover himself in leaves, while walking on a tree floating in a lake? It's good balance and agility training too, but well, the leaf thing is kind of accidental. He's still got no control over his bloodline abilities, and it's gotten worse since he started getting another mark on his shoulder to match the original one on his face. A bush reached out and grabbed him on his way through that brush there on the edge of the lake, so he must have decided he might as well use the leaves too. Shizun and I have tried everything we can think of to help him out with his botanical problems, but nothing works. Well, he's just shy of six. Maybe it's a maturity thing? The fact that he's getting another mark could mean that the Keke Jenke has stages like the Sharingan, and he's just got to level it up or something. Level it up? My son isn't a video game. Yeah, well, you know what I mean. Jiraiya frowned and fiddled with the bit of metal in his hands. He'd been tinkering with this seal since Naruto's B incident, but he just couldn't get it to do quite what he had in mind. If it keeps going much farther than this, I might have to scrape up enough to hire a mission out of Konoha, and Anbu are expensive, so if you've got any suggestions that don't require feeding him coins, please let me know. You mean hiring Tenzo to come train the brat? Sensei's not likely to go along with that, not even for you. I know he's the only other Mokutan user currently living after what that bastard Orochimaru did to him, but Anbu don't grow on trees, and he's really been moving up in rank lately. With Danzo around, they need him there. He glanced up through his spiky bangs at his frowning teammate, you may have to send him to the village if you aren't willing to move back there, yourself. Her grimace turned feral and she slammed a fist down on the table, cracking it but not breaking it in half. Shizun only bought reinforced furniture for her mentor if she could possibly help it, and it was much cheaper and easier to find in a town like this dominated by ninja, retired or not. I'm not sending him back there by himself. He's still a baby and that place is cursed and a death trap. Hey, I was just saying. Besides, you know I'm right. Tenzo could be the only one that might be able to help him. Well, we'll just have to hope it doesn't come to that. She growled, forcing herself to calm down and unclench her teeth before she gave herself a migraine. No point in worrying about it right now. If he can hold off on it for a few more years, I really think he'll have met your requirements by the time he's 10 or 11 he only got hit twice in dodge training today, and you looked like you weren't holding back much on speed. When he's ready, I can have Sensei and the Mokutan kid look at him when I take him back to get his headband. Che, the dodging's impressive but I can't believe he's made so much damn progress on that strength technique, she fumed. You should know how determined he can be when he really wants something. Jiraiya pointed out, yeah, well how could I have known that it was possible to achieve perfect control of just one technique when your natural level is almost completely average? She growled, it shouldn't be possible to learn something like that through nothing but repetition and sheer force of will. Well, you didn't tell him it wasn't possible, so of course he could do it. Jiraiya grinned, he's going to break all sorts of rules of possibility, if for no other reason than he's too stupid to think it through and realize it's impossible before he starts, and he won't give up once he begins trying something until he can do it flawlessly. He should have expected her fist to the top of his head, but somehow, he never saw it coming. Baka, my son is not stupid. He's just got too much damn energy to sit still and learn things. It's the damn Kayubi's fault for jacking his chakra levels so fucking high. I've assigned him two hours at the shogi parlor every day as part of his training, so hopefully that'll teach him patience and a little strategy. 
If he pisses the old guys there off too much by running around, they won't give him pointers or show him jutsu anymore. It's got nothing to do with the fact that people bet on shogi, and he absolutely can't lose games of chance, is it? Jiraiya grinned, as he picked himself up off the ground and regained his now kind of wobbly seat. You know that kid will never be good at planning and conventional tactics. He's too much of a natural genius at improvisation and unpredictable creative strategy in the middle of battle to ever slow himself down and apply people that aren't Naruto logic to a situation. Tsunade sighed, I know. He's absolutely hopeless at long-term analysis. He can't think, what would I do in this situation, to predict other people's actions because no one else would ever think of half the shit he does, and more than half the time his answer to the question would be, I just wing it, anyway. I'd say he'd have to grow out of that if he wants to be Hokage someday, but it always seems to work out for him so it's hard to criticize. Tsunade groaned and buried her head in her arms, I know. The kid can't lose if probability is involved. It's not fair. Impulsively she stood up, knocking her chair over in the process and pointed accusingly at Naruto, hey brat. Stop stealing all of my luck, you little bastard. The yell broke Naruto's concentration and all his leaves went fluttering into the lake while he wobbled frantically on the now unstable log before catching his balance. Hey, you old hag. You almost made me fall in, he screamed back. Jiraiya chuckled and went back to fiddling with his new seal, ignoring Tsunade's grumblings about ungrateful little brats with no respect for their mother's suffering. I wouldn't complain too much if I were you, he said, turning serious. I'm pretty sure he'd be dead by now if he had your luck instead of. Minato's with some of the trouble he gets himself into and the way he pushes himself training with new jutsu and chakra techniques without anyone watching him. Tsunade sighed, but had to agree. When it came to getting stronger, the kid just loved it and refused to fail at anything he set his mind to. She'd done everything she could think of to curtail his chakra use without supervision, but he was the most headstrong and independent little bastard ever. He had to get it from his father. That jerk had a lot to answer for when she met up with him again in the afterlife. No way did he get his stubbornness and willingness to take chances from her side of the family. So, want to play another hand of cards? Double or nothing? Hell yeah, now you're talking. She eagerly agreed. Naruto glared down at the floating leaves that he'd been dutifully holding with his chakra while balancing on the log which he was keeping stable in the lake with a great deal of concentration. He was getting kind of frustrated. He seemed to have reached a plateau in his training and it was really pissing him off. He was pretty sure if he could just etch out another little bit of control, he'd be able to perform a bunch in, and from there, it was just another small step to his Ka-san's freakish strength. Technically, for him, the strength and bunch in should be about the same difficulty because freakish strength required a lot more chakra. Every night he stayed out late hitting boulders, blocks, and logs until they shattered, but it was still taking two or three hits instead of just one, and he frequently had to heal his arm afterwards. He'd gotten to the point where he didn't have to think about how to mold and release the chakra anymore when it used to take him ages to prepare himself for a single attempt. He was even pretty sure he could use this much of it in battle since it was coming so naturally to him, but it wasn't nearly as good as Ka Sans and when he messed up and hurt himself, well, that wouldn't be good in a fight. He'd narrowed down the possible problems to one or two things. He was pretty sure he was building up enough chakra in preparation, or at least as much as he was capable of at his size and age. He could feel the pressure on his chakra coils whenever he did it, and he knew if anything, he'd been able to gather more of it than he used to do, so the solution wasn't to use more chakra. He was really glad to have ticked that one off the list because his aunt was always on his case that all problems can't be solved by applying more chakra to them. She'd had a field day with that rant when he'd originally begun having so much trouble with Bunchen. No, he had to be either not narrowing and condensing the point down tiny enough, or not releasing it at the right moment. He knew he wasn't releasing it way too soon because his arm never exploded off of his body, but he thought there might be an interval between way too soon and right on time. It was also possible he was letting it go too late. He had tried all sorts of combinations, but the answer still eluded him. Either way, it was a chakra control problem because he just couldn't make it do exactly what he wanted it to, but he was a lot closer with that one, than the chakra scalpel jutsu. That one required a small, precise, and sustained amount of chakra, and he kind of thought it might always be beyond him. He figured that since he'd never had the natural control his mom and aunt had, 
he just have to treat each jutsu like another chakra exercise as well as a technique. He may not be able to intuitively know just exactly the right amount to use, but if he tried it often enough, he was sure to stumble on it eventually. He did have excellent senses, and he knew when he did it correctly because it just felt like it was right. It was an uphill struggle because while most people just had a decent sized puddle to feed through their chakra coils, he had a damn leg. When the valves were open, the pressure was higher. It made it much harder to regulate. It was like trying to get exactly a liter of water from the floodgates on a dam versus the taps on a faucet. To further complicate things, his proverbial faucet was always leaking power to his seal to keep Kayubi back, and therefore, throwing off the flow. He plopped himself down on the log, and being sure to keep his chakra flowing around it and down to the bottom of the lake so it stayed stable, he carefully took off his sandals and threw them on the shore so he could dangle his feet in the water without soaking his footwear. Idly he swished his legs back and forth, tracking the underwater movements he was causing by the way the submerged leaves moved. He tried to get them moving farther away or to go in specific directions by hitting the water harder, and using more forceful movements, but that just made them swirl around a lot. They hardly ever even hit the log he was sitting on as the currents pushed ahead of them and bounced off of the wood before they got there, repelling them back. He found that if he got closer to them before plunging his foot in, it was a little easier to get them to do what he wanted because there was less room for the water to spread out and make the leaf do other weird things. Also, they obeyed a bit better if he approached them slowly and sped up gradually to disturb the water as little as possible outside of the main movement. Wait a minute. Eagerly he jumped off of the log and sprang the distance between it and the shore, sprinting for the old wall behind their house that was his favorite target for super punching practice. Instead of focusing the chakra just generally, in his hand, he'd try to put it on the very edge, right on the knuckles. If he was lucky, maybe that would even protect him a bit from the force of the hit. That must be how Ka San does it. She puts the chakra point at exactly the right distance from her knuckles so that there's enough room for a slight buffer around her hand, but releases it as close as possible so all of the force is directed into the target except for that tiny protective bit. She builds it up slowly and then bam at the right moment, smash. Jiraiya watched him run past as he raked in his winnings while Tsunade dealt the next hand of cards. I think you're in trouble. He's got that sudden epiphany look on his face his father used to get when he finally figured out the trick to something like the Rasengan. Tsunade growled, well, he might figure out the punching part, but the kicks are much harder because chakra is so much more difficult to mold in the feet. Bet you 100 Ryo he'll have the whole thing mastered and combat ready within two years. Ha, huh, deal, there's no way even my kid is that brilliant. Maybe if he only had that to focus on, but I bet you didn't know how hard Shizun's working him on Senban accuracy. He bet me 50 Ryo last week that he'd be so good at it in a year that he'll be able to safely throw them during dodging practice and hit any target with at least 90 accuracy. And he's got to learn a basic medical jutsu and memorize the biology behind it every other month until he's 7 is punishment for purposefully giving me the wrong numbers on last week's lottery ticket and selling the right ones to everyone else in town. What's with the sudden interest in weapons? He can hardly throw a kanai or shuriken to save his life, does he even own any? I know you haven't been teaching them, and while he's never really complained about senban practice, it's never been his favorite. Hey, well, he saw Shizun temporarily disable a pervert's ahem, equipment, the other day when they caught him trying to peep in the changing rooms at the department store where she had to take him to replace his jacket after the cake incident. Jiraiya swallowed nervously, crossed his legs again and made a mental note not to mess with Tsunade's apprentice, cake incident? You don't want to know. Think of the beach ball debacle only about three times worse and involving more old men in golf shirts. Wow, yeah, we're not allowed back at the dog park anymore. Poor Taunton, she really liked the dog park here. The day was hot and the water was cold, and best of all, there wasn't a plant within petting distance. This was definitely Naruto's favorite place of everywhere they had lived so far. They'd come here right after his 8th birthday and were still here several months later. He grinned, constantly adjusting his chakra output to keep him on top of the madly rolling surf, then leapt up in a nimble flipping maneuver when the waves pulled him too close to the rocky shore. This was heaven, why hadn't they moved to the seaside much sooner? His smile threatened to spilt his face as he plopped himself down on one of the large black rocks that jutted out into the ocean on his favorite training beach. 
Not so far off in the distance he could hear other children laughing and playing over the sound of the constantly moving surf. He liked to sit and watch the families when he ran out of usable chakra or just needed a break. Some of the kids had pets to throw frisbees to, or siblings to dunk in the water, and almost all of them had fathers. He sighed and shook his head to clear it of those kinds of thoughts as well as to shed some of the moisture that had gathered in his hair from his romp. It didn't help the later problem much, his blonde mop stayed pretty much soaked from the ocean spray, but it did get his mind off of the former and he eagerly stood back up and stretched, ready to have another go on chakra surfing. This was such a cool technique, and he thought if he worked on it enough, he might be able to change it up so it worked on other unstable surfaces like snow or sand. How cool would that be? Before he could hop back onto the water and make a mad dash for the deeps, he had to be careful to time the jumps correctly and get out of the way fast or he'd be smashed against the rocks. He heard a sudden shout and the rumbling of falling stones. His head shot up and his eyes darted in the direction of the noise over towards the formerly laughing family that had been playing in the sand. The dog was missing and so was the littlest kid, a daughter who'd been wearing a bright yellow sundress. Without thinking about it further, he took off towards the remaining two adults and older sibling. When he got closer, he saw that the mother had tears running down her face and a hand over her mouth. The father was leaning into a small crevice barely larger than Naruto's shoulders. Nina, the man yelled, but there was no answer. What happened? Naruto asked the slightly older boy who was standing beside his mother and looking kind of guilty and very worried. My sister. I, well, I threw the ball for Muffy, that's our dog, and it accidentally went into the rocks there. Muffy went in after it, and when he didn't come out right away, Nina followed him in, and then the entrance collapsed a little, and now she won't answer us. Damn, Naruto scampered forward over the sand and rocks to look at the little cave beside the frantic father. He bit his lip and thought. Ka-san had warned him that this area was riddled with tunnels and caverns made by the same volcanoes that had left the huge chunks of rocks lying all around, and volcano rock was pretty full of holes to begin with, even without the ocean working on it for years. She'd told him to be careful if he practiced making craters with his newly mastered freakish strength, because you could never tell if you were on top of something like that, and you could open up a hole that went much farther down than you expected. It looked to him like Nina and Muffy had found one of those little caves and were probably trapped now. What are we going to do? Oh, Nina. The woman behind them wailed and the father cringed, looking helpless. The man began to twist the large ring on his finger, deep in thought. Calm down, darling. I'm sure she just slipped when the rocks here fell and now she'd too scared to come out. We'll get some men here to move the rocks and have her out in minutes. That will take too long. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Naruto quipped, I'll go in after her and bring her back. I think I'm small enough to squeeze in. One of you can just run to town and find my Ka-san in case we need her to move these rocks. She's a really strong ninja and a medic. The woman began wailing at the prospect of her daughter needing medical attention. I appreciate the offer, but I don't think it's safe for you to go down there, you could end up trapped too. You stay up here, and I'll go to town for help. Where can I find your Ka-san? She's a tall woman with blonde hair and, gamble, written on the back of her coat. My Nichan will be with her with a little pig. Nichan has dark hair and a black yukata. If they aren't at the hospital, they'll be at the casino. You'd better check there first, since it's closer. Ka-san's name is Tsunade. Tsunade? The legendary medic Nen? He gasped, hurriedly standing up to go find her. Yeah, she'll definitely be able to help. He nodded and took off towards the town as fast as he could while his son attempted to comfort his mother. Naruto looked back at the hole and bit his lip again. The man was probably right, he shouldn't go down, but the little girl could be hurt or something, and it must be scary to be trapped down in a hole. He was sure he'd be okay with his chakra. If he needed to, he could just walk up the wall or something to get out. Thinking things through before acting would never be his strong point. Without further ado, he used his own strength to toss aside the main stone blocking the entrance and then began to squeeze himself through what was left of the opening. Hey, dad said you should wait for help from town. The other boy gasped, his hands twisting nervously in his silk beach robe. Don't worry, Naruto called, I'll be fine. I'm practically a ninja already, too. It was a tight squeeze between the rocks for what seemed like ages. It took him quite a while to worm through. 
and he scraped his knees and elbows several times before the tunnel suddenly opened up into an area wide enough that he could comfortably stand up, then seemed to widen even more up ahead as it sloped down a bit into uncertain blackness. Nina, he called, coughing a little on rock dust in the air and looking around. It was really dark in there. He wished he'd thought to bring a flashlight or something, but he hadn't packed anything but weapons and a few bottles of water into his ninja pouch that morning. The light from the opening was getting smaller and smaller and further and further away as he walked on. Nina wasn't answering, but he thought he heard a dog whimpering somewhere up ahead. The noise was echoing oddly, so he couldn't be sure. There was a sudden rumbling and before he could even scream, the ground fell out from under him, sending him tumbling into a quickly widening hole he hadn't seen in the floor several feet away. Tsunade tuned Shizun out as she put another coin into the machine in front of her and pulled the handle. Who cared if she blew a few Ryo on the slots? It wasn't like their work wasn't in high demand. She was the best medic nin in all of the five countries. They weren't in debt like they'd been before she'd gotten over her phobia of blood. She could always make up the cash she lost by saving some rich bastard's wife from a splinter or something. Nobles would pay the stupidest prices for fixing the lamest things, and they wanted only the best. This place was teeming with rich people on vacation some in disguise, and some not, but half of them hypochondriacs. The little wheels in the machine turned and clanked and Shizun lectured on and on. Cherry, 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 oh crap, something horrible must have happened. The last wheel stopped on cherry too. Lights and buzzers went off, and coins began clinking into the tray in front of her. Shizun stopped and stared at her mentor, a look of horror on her face, you won. That was never ever, ever, a good sign. Damn, where's Naru-chan? Just then, a man ran up to them, panting and looking worried. Are you Tsunade, the medic nin? Your son said you could help me. My daughter is lost in some rocks on the beach. Tsunade stopped collecting her coins and immediately jumped up from her stool. Where at? Show us. Together the three, plus one pig ran towards the shoreline. Naruto groaned and struggled to open his eyes. There was an odd pressure on his left side and everything hurt like he'd just got done with a dodging practice gun horribly wrong. He had no idea where he was or what had happened, and even when he finally managed to pry his eyelids up, it didn't help. Wherever he was, it was pitch black in there. He could smell rock dust and hear water dripping somewhere, but couldn't make out anything else about his surroundings or remember quite how he'd gotten there. His arm and ribs hurt so badly he could hardly think, and he could feel the Kyubi trying to get at whatever was wrong in order to heal him. If that happened, he'd be in trouble because he couldn't do much to get himself out of this mess, let alone a scared little girl, if he was seizing and coughing up blood. He had to figure out where he was and try to stop it. The ground beneath him seemed to be made of uneven, porous rock, and there were smaller stones digging into his back. He felt along the object pinning him, and judging by the texture and the way it curved around and to the side, he realized it had to be a larger version of the stones he was laying on. Similar boulders seemed to be wedged all around him, and by the feel of his headache, one of them had become acquainted with his skull at some point. He couldn't hold back a groan of pain and a little whimper as he tried to wiggle experimentally to see how stuck he was. Nothing budged. Memories of what had happened began to trickle through and he knew he had to free himself before too much of the fox's chakra entered his system. He was already beginning to feel a little feverish, the first sign of chakra sickness. It was hard to concentrate, but he managed to summon up enough energy into his coils to use some approximation of his freakish strength and move the boulder holding him down. Kyubi's power must have already mixed enough with his system to cause some problems, because instead of just pushing the rock aside, it exploded on impact splattering him with sharp splinters of stone, and his tenketsu burned like nothing he'd ever felt before. He nearly screamed with the pain of it. Oh, not good, not good, I want Kasan. He forced himself to calm down and take a few breaths. Panicking wasn't going to help anything. He'd never before tried to use his chakra much when Kayubi's energy was leaking into his system, and he made a mental note not to try it again if he could help it but he managed to fight down the lasting ache to clear his thoughts enough to function again. He gripped his wounded shoulder and was disconcerted when his hand came away wet and sticky with blood. He forced himself into some semblance of a meditative pose, gasping through the pain as he struggled into a sitting position. He slumped against one of the larger rocks and pulled his legs up. This was so not good. His stomach tingled more urgently, 
where the seal sat, and the mark on his cheek began to burn. He frantically sent as much chakra as he could towards the site to try and keep the filter intact. If he could only strengthen it enough to hold for a few minutes, there. Quickly, while he was able to use his chakra for other things, he tried to summon up one of the few healing jutsu he knew, a basic, heal light wounds sort of thing, but it was the best he could manage at the moment. His left arm didn't want to work right to form the seals, and it took him four tries with even the small amount of Kyubi's power in his system throwing off his control. He usually had about a 75% success rate with basic healing jutsu, but he'd never had to try it under these kinds of conditions before. He silently promised himself that he wouldn't argue with Ka-san and Shizun about augmenting his training with medic nin skills anymore, if he managed to survive this. He finally succeeded in activating the jutsu. A light green glow sputtered around his right hand, and he immediately held it over the large, bleeding gash on his shoulder and ran it down over his aching ribs. As he worked, it got easier to keep back the fox's power, and the jutsu flowed more smoothly, but there was only so much he could do. By the eerie green light of his glowing hand, he could see that the rock that had fallen on him had been sharp and heavy enough to make several small gashes along with the larger slash he'd been healing, and he was bruised up really good, but he didn't think his shoulder was dislocated. It evidentially hadn't damaged anything too important because the bleeding was sluggish and he could still move his fingers. By the feel of his head, he'd probably had a concussion at one point but he guessed that's where Kyubi's chakra had been heading because he wasn't dizzy enough to be newly concussed. He took a few more deep, painful breaths and tried to remember what Shizun and Ka-san had told him to do if he were ever hurt by himself somewhere. Emergency medical care? Check. Assess the surroundings? Check. Figure out as much as he could about the rest of the situation? Well, he guessed that was next. He killed the power to the healing jutsu and started up the diagnostic one he just learned last month. He didn't like what it told him, but it could have been much worse. It looked like two of his ribs were cracked, but the bones in his arm were whole and he'd been right about his head, it wasn't a full-blown concussion anymore. All in all, he needed more medical attention than he could give himself, but he didn't need it right away. He had water in his pouch, not much but enough to last him a few days if he rationed it. Now that he knew where he was, what was wrong with him, and had determined how long he could stay that way, he needed to figure out how to get out. He knew he couldn't afford to burn the chakra it would take to keep a light going indefinitely, but if he fell down again or something, having chakra left wouldn't do him much good. Besides, he had to find the little girl, and see if she was hurt, and then see if he could get them out of there. This was proving to be a much tougher task than he'd thought when he climbed into that hole. Hopefully his Ka-san was on the way, he didn't want to admit it, even to himself, but he was only eight, and he was scared and hurt and wanted a hug. Okay, calm down, calm down. He closed his eyes and concentrated. He'd been trying to learn the chakra scalpel for ages, but the control at that amount of small required output was still beyond him. When he'd begun learning it, it had been a sort of compromise between himself and his Ka-san. He'd wanted a cool offensive jutsu, and she'd wanted him to learn how to ease inflammation. They'd settled on the chakra scalpel because it could be both a medical jutsu and used offensively. Unfortunately, his scalpel was more like a chakra butter knife. It worked really well in this situation though because instead of coating his fingers in a sharp, thin layer of energy, it lit up his hand in glowing blue waves. He levered himself upright and staggered along the way a bit until he could see the ceiling of the area he'd tumbled in with the jutsu's light. It looked like the floor of the smaller cave up above had given way sending him down in a shower of rocks into this cavern, which stretched on in an undeterminable distance in front of him. Studying what he could see of the area above, he thought it ended in this hole. He hadn't seen any other offshoots when he'd been up there, and the walls rose on three sides of the chasm. That meant Nina and Muffy had to be down here with him somewhere. What remained of the ledge was about 20 feet up at a sharp incline and bits of sand and small stones fell down between the rocks piled up making a sort of really steep ramp. He figured he must have at least partially rolled down that because if he'd fallen from that height with the boulders littering the floor, he doubted he'd have survived. If he weren't hurt, he thought he'd have been able to climb back to the main tunnel easily, and he could probably still make it up there if he absolutely had to, but he hadn't found the little girl yet, so he couldn't just abandon her here. He chewed on his bottom lip, a habit he'd picked up from Aero Gigi, 
and looked from the hole in the ceiling towards the forbidding darkness of the tunnel in front of him. He didn't want to go, but Nina couldn't be much older than him, if she was even his age yet, and she wasn't a ninja, so she was bound to be even more scared. He'd told her dad he would go get her, and he never went back on his words. There was nothing for it. He gasped in pain, even breathing hurt with the damage to his ribcage, but began to stagger down the tunnel, his chakra lighting up the pathway in front of him. He used as little as he could, but it still showed him the uneven path a good five feet ahead. Hopefully it would be good enough to keep him from falling into another pit. He wished he'd thought of it sooner, it might have prevented this mess. It wasn't too long before Shizun and Tsunade reached the beach where Nina's mother and brother were waiting anxiously. The slug Sanin felt her stomach drop when she didn't spot Naruto with them. Knowing her son's penchant for getting into horrible situations, there was little doubt he'd decided to play hero. She had hypothesized that the gene for stupidly risking your neck for other people must be hardwired into the particular blue of his eyes because his father'd had the same eyes and the same problem. Damn that man. It had taken about 10 minutes for them to arrive on the scene, traveling at the fastest speed their guide could run, and Tsunade mentally cursed all non-shinobi as she quickly strolled forwards to assess the situation. A small opening in the rocks was the only clue to where the children had gone. He he followed Nina in there. She turned to face the sobbing woman, holding tightly to the boy beside her that could only be her son and staring unblinkingly at the rocks. The little blonde boy went in after her, but neither of them has come out yet, and we heard more rumbling a minute ago. Tsunade thought she was going to be sick. No, no, no. Not her Naru-chan, he was fine. He was the strongest damn brat she'd ever seen, and she'd made sure he was well grounded in medical basics. There was no way a few rocks were going to kill her stupidly heroic son. Shizun caught her wrist before she could send a chakra imbued punch into the rock pile to enlarge the opening. No, this area must be really unstable if there have been minor collapses twice in an hour, and this sort of rock is extremely fragile. Destroying more of the structure could bring it all down and crush them. You're right, Tsunade sighed, she needed to get it together. She obviously wasn't thinking clearly. Worry and fear were clouding her judgment. We're going to have to do it the hard way. She picked up a boulder the size of a small pony with one hand and threw it aside. The worried father, now comforting his wife and son, gaped on, completely stunned, then hurried to help them widen the opening. Shizun, go back to town and get us more help. Bring ropes and lights too. This cave must be pretty deep if they can't hear us calling to them, so we'll need a group of workers. Yes, of course. The younger woman scrambled to obey. The rest of Nina's family came forward to help move debris as best they could. That's all for now if you enjoy then please like share and do comments.